I have press broadcast Liam. G'day, guys. Uh, we have kicked off this very professional stream with Liam and I talking absolute rubbish. Uh, it is Down Under Sigma. We are at episode nine. If you're tuning in, thanks for uh, putting up with our hot garbage for this long. Uh, it's, it's like almost, I think next next fortnight is like 20 weeks of, of content you guys have put up with us, so we must be doing all right. Um, Liam, how are you? I am absolutely stunning. Um, just recovering from the weekend of slaughter. And um, yeah, it's been good. What about yourself, man? Yeah, same thing. So we had uh, Sydney Slaughter, which was a two-day narrative slash match play event. Uh, it is. It's like a it's it is it's like a match play event, but it's not your traditional scenarios. It's very heavily weighted towards story, and uh, it's a great weekend. Chris Welfare and and James Mabry from Mortally Wounded uh, put on a great weekend. Um, yeah, big big hobby. Travis, who is one of our guests, uh, was there as well. Um, so it's been good, but um, let's actually talk about it, I guess, first. So uh, introduced from my left, we have James. G'day, James. G'day, Coach, and everybody else out there on the internet. My name is James, as we've just established. Um, been painting miniatures for probably about 15 to 20 years now. There's a bit of a gap in the middle, so don't know how to quantify the actual amount of time that's been spent but yeah, here to hopefully talk about some good hobby tonight with everyone. It's the traditional gap between meeting girls and meeting boys, and then you come back when you build a bit of street cred and then the nerdiness is okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. My wife always complains that I lulled her into some false sense of security. She's like, you weren't this nerdy when we met, but um, it was always there <laughs> under the surface. That's true. I, I'm exactly the same. Like, it was, as soon as we got, was, as soon as I had a few, a few years under the belt, it was just like, Pow! Crazy nerd. Uh, and James, you recently won, but, but, but before I go to our next guest, you recently won an award. I just want to acknowledge really quickly. You won the? Uh, the Warhammer Community Monthly Painting Challenge. Is that the one you're talking about? I mean, you, you win lots of awards, but yes, that is the one that I was referring to. <laughs> I just needed just a that sly, just, that, just that sly, like, yeah, you win a lot. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, got to get it in somewhere. Uh, yeah, so that was um, a big surprise and a great honour to um, pull out the monthly painting competition for that. So, yeah, it was really good. Got to share that around with a lot of different people. It was good. That is awesome. awesome. Speaking of, of street cred, so James has got plenty of street cred. My my uh, painting judge from last year from Sydney GT, we have Natalie here. <laughs> Nat, how are you? Yeah, good. Yourself? Uh, good. Liam, how are you? <laughs> Fine. Yeah. Um. There we go. Um, but yeah, um, so I'm Nat with an unpronounceable surname. Um, it's just best not to try most of the time. Uh, basically, I run um, so EVA Studios and I've got Evelina as my account on most sort of um, social media and stuff like that. Um, I just, I paint a lot of stuff. Um, I try and work with a whole bunch of you know, color and stuff like that, but yeah, I paint stuff. You're very modest as well. You, you're a great, <laughs> yeah, and you um, also draw a lot. Don't uh, you? yeah, so I, um, so on that as part of EVA Studios, I do everything from illustration to you know, if there's something that exists, I'll try and paint it, sort of do my best. Um, uh, but otherwise, I do you know, all the boring graph design stuff, but that's not what he would. That's not what we're here to talk about. So, but, uh, just, and a just, bit of peer pressure here, Nat. Go on, Liam. What? I was about to say, just putting out that she does more creative stuff because I remember seeing all her drawings and stuff when we worked together. Like, I think it was like now two years ago. Yeah, yeah. it's been a while. Yeah, I'm about to, I'm about to off shame her as well because things that she used to do really well, but she's kind of dropped off the planet. Is her Twitch account? So she used to uh, be pretty active <laughs> on Twitch. Um, but if you want to catch up with some of her old stuff, um, she's she is a wonderful painter. Yeah, so um, I am trying to get back into that. So we've got, um, I've got another Aussie streamer that I'm looking at doing a Tutorial Tuesday series on soon. Uh, basically just need to, you know, kick him into gear to get that started and regular. Uh, but aside from that, uh, I started painting probably, I think we're looking at about six years ago now. Um, as opposed to James, I got dragged into it by my partner. <laughs> so that was already established and I can blame him for any hobby purchases. It's great. Um, um, 
And then I think it was 2016, the Armies on Parade sort of, of that year was when I decided to start sort of knuckling down and trying to figure out the, you know, what I'm doing with painting and you know, actually trying to get better and better at it. Uh, I, I just got to call this out from the chat. I think we've blown somebody's mind that uh, Matt Hibbel is painting while listening to a, a painting stream. So, uh, Inception. Like, it's the best way to do it. Can I, can, can I also just say, I remember, I think one of the first times I met Nat was at an Armies on Parade. And like, I think it was like one of my first shifts working at GW. And she rocks up, <laughs> puts this, puts this like plain like realm of battle board or something like the same size. And I was like, oh, okay, like that's cool. Then she comes by, plonks something on top of it, and it just it, it spins. It was like a spinning armies on parade. And I was like, I give up. Why would anyone even like bother trying to compete? Because it's just a spinning zeech like disc thing. I was like, I actually okay. felt kind of bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I ended up doing basically a giant floating island, and. God knows how I managed to like hot glue a um, a turntable on the inside so the entire thing spun. That thing was it nightmare was... to transport to. I don't, yeah, I just remember I was like, okay, cool. Um, and I had to do the presentation and I just had to try and pronounce her unpronounceable last name and I gave up. <laughs> so yeah, it was good. I love and I was like, the first yeah. time I was met Nat, I was like, what? Mind blown. So not only do we have two amazing painters on the stream, we also have a man with an STG, but more importantly, a herald of war and a fantastic painter and hobbyist. Sorry, that's a that was for Hayden, who's who wanted to know about how how Travis wins with STDs, and I said, Hayden, it's okay if you have, if you have a sexual disease, it's all right. You can still play Warhammer, but that's not the STDs Travis plays with. How are you, mate? Hello, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> Disease-free, I promise. Um, yeah, While I uh, laugh my ass off, do you want to intro yourself, please? Give as long as you can, so uh, I can settle down. <laughs> All right. Um, so my name is Travis. I'm um, I've been painting since about 1998. Uh, I think I worked out it'd be just over 20 years. A um, bit of a gap in the middle where I moved sort of fairly long distance, but um, took me a while to get back into it. Um, but um, yes, it's been 20, I'd say probably maybe 17 or 18 years on, off and on. Um, I started off well, when I was, what, 12, 13 or something like that, um, just, um, you know, bashing out the starter sets like everyone else. Um, and then really probably only in the last four or five years or so, I, I, I sort of stopped just trying to paint whatever I could, whenever I could, and actually put a lot more sort of thought or um, uh, practice into it as well. Um, so to really try and I guess start getting better at it. Um, yeah, I, I, as, as as alluded to, I am um, I, I currently playing with a slate Age the Darkness Army. It's the um, the STD acronym, um, but um, it's uh, it's only an army and not a reference to anything else. Hello to my wife. Um, and um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, that's um, that's that's I guess the brief history of me. Um, I. I go to events, but I don't usually go there to compete. I typically don't take competitive armies. Um, I, I take an army that's got a bit of a story behind it or something that I've enjoyed putting together. Um, and um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, other than that, I haven't really done like much like competition painting or anything like that. Um, you know, I enter armies on parade and things like that, but um, nothing super Correct. serious. You know, Correct me if I'm wrong, you either won or you placed at South Coast GT two years ago? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. So for the army, I didn't. Um, so uh, yeah, I was at South Coast GT, which is a massive Age of Sigmar event over in the UK. It's probably not considered massive anymore, considering there's others close to it or more than it. Um, but um, at the time, it was by far the largest at 198 or so, 196, I think. Um, I didn't, I didn't place anything in the, um, the, 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 I guess the army painting aspect of it. Um, but I wouldn't have expected to, cause there was just some outrageously good stuff there. Um, like armies that should have been, you know, sitting in the cabinets at Warhammer world cause they were painted by heavy metal painters and stuff like it was ridiculous. Um, but I was, I was happy just to be shortlisted in that group of, um, 12 or so. So, um, but I did, they, they have like a separate painting competition they run there. So I did pick up um, one spot for a uh, unit of Kurnoth Hunters from my um, Sylvaneth army. So I was pretty happy with that. But um, yeah, I, I, I managed to snag one of those. So it was great. And 
And also the famous STD has been showcased on Wyoming Community, right? Your army? Uh, yeah, so that's probably my um, my largest claim to flame, fame, if you can call the thing. Um, so uh, six months or so ago now, I had a, a army spotlight done uh, on my Slayer Sadakis army on Warhammer Community website, um, which yeah. I was just sort of thrilled with at the time because it was, you know, it's the sort of thing you kind of you know, aspire to, gold. And, um, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was it was pretty awesome to see like an Aussie like yourself just be like showcased to the whole world, just being like, "Yep, cool. This is what Australia is doing." And still, I'm pretty sure on the weekend, heaps of people were just like mind blown by how much conversions you've done onto that army. Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely very proud of it. Um, a lot of working into it. Um, it's all been sort of basically scratch built, I guess. So, um, so there's not a model on the on the table, I guess. At the end of the day, that's not. Um, Put together from multiple kits or have bits changed and chopped and stuff like that um so yeah definitely proud of it and definitely happy to have it up on the website as well so it's great yeah congrats to that as well thank you yeah it's an amazing looking army i'm really sad i haven't got to see it in person yet i was hoping to at cancon last year but it didn't make the journey yeah uh yeah it actually was there um but i was just too busy to get up and then go and wander around and talk to people so um, <laughs> how dare you be the to support for australia's largest event and the world's largest event yeah so at least he does it really at least he does it unlike me if it drops out <laughs> what are these yeah, priorities true. um it'll be there i'm not i'm not t assistant toing or any other form of toing this year though so i'll be there and i'll i'll bring it along regardless of whether it's the army i'm playing with or not so um, if anyone wants to have a look, I'll set it up somewhere and away you go. Awesome. Sweet. So if people haven't got the theme, the theme is about levelling up your painting. Uh, it's a great time. You've got uh, the Ever Chosen competition coming up. It's actually, I think it's like five weeks, six weeks away. Uh, Army's on parades not long after that. And then we've got CanCon, which is traditionally a time where people set up uh, or, or create a new army. So um, the theme of today's topic, when we get to it, is really going to be about learning from these three amazing painters, award-winning painters, um, champion painters, um, how they got to where they are, uh, and more importantly, what those lessons are that we can take away to improve um, our our skills and knowledge no matter where we are on the journey. Um, that's kind of like uh, what I want out of today. Uh, before we get into that, Liam, what uh, what's come out lately? What, what news have we had uh, from so a GW point of view? So pretty much we got contrast paints coming out this weekend, um, which I'm super excited about because I got to play with it today. Um, had a really close look at them, which was really cool. So that's a bit of news and I've just been showcasing like what it can do with it. So currently on the Wyoming community site, they got um, John Blanche um, showcasing what he's done with his um, play with contrast. Um, and then I think for the most competitive match play guys, uh, GHB got announced uh, Monday morning, our time, which is super exciting. Um, and then a new type of gaming called meeting engagements is coming in to that book, which I'm super curious on how it will be played out. I love um, it. I, uh, I, I can see now that my diary, uh, if I had a shared diary with my wife, uh, I would, I would block out these times and it would say meeting engagement. And then my wife would think, oh, he's at work. He's doing something that's business related. Uh, it's about two and a half hours. Yeah, cool. I get that. The meeting engagement. Uh, when actually we're playing with war dollies. Yeah. I, the way that it's kind of like, it's, I see people talking about it being like, it's super competitive, but I'm pretty sure it's like targeted to narrative, but, um, Didn't it say yeah, open the, play? Isn't it open play structure? I, I think it's like open play, but I think there can be like, they say it's around a thousand points. I think it's really weird the way it's like been worded. It's like, oh, it's like open play, but it's like, it's around a thousand point four. So I'm like, which one is it? Like, is this match or open play? But um, yeah, I'm super interested to play some games under that. Um, and I just like how it's by waves. Like you just do it by wave and when they come out, um, which I think is really cool. And that's the current new news. Um, we've just had a few events happening around Australia, which like, for example, Slaughter, Batricon. Um, I don't know, haven't heard anything from Queensland, but I do know those two events happened over the weekend. Man, they had, they had um, Bruce, Bruce Hammer before, uh, not long before. Oh, that. yeah, before that, yeah. So, yeah, we've had yeah, quite a lot happening with news. And I'm pretty sure Greenskins podiumed in Queensland. I think that's big news. Yeah, Dino, yeah. Dino Matthews did uh, did very well. I think Dave Kerr won with Grotz. Uh, Dino Matthews had done well uh, with so, the Greenskins. But... 
I don't see why people complaining about destruction needs a help when they seem fine. I they probably sounds, sounds, sounds like they need a points adjustment to go up. Sounds like those yeah. uh those orcs are busted. They are so busted. I think um Flesh of Courts need to go down in points and same with Doors of Cain. So yeah. So but m- 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 we'll move away from your the bullshit that's spewing out of your mouth right now. And I wanna ask my guests, um our guests, yeah. um have you guys had a chance to play anyone lately? I know Travis, you've obviously played played Slaughter. Um, Nat, James, have you guys had an opportunity to play anyone recently? Um, uh, yeah. Um, I ended up jumping in on one of our local stores. Sort of, um, it was basically a beginners friendly league because, as much as I enjoy painting, uh, playing definitely takes a uh, second rung for that one. Um, so ends up playing that. It was a really nice sort of casual format, you know, come and play a game once every two weeks. Uh, lost every game. It was fantastic. Uh, but I'm going to have a nice shiny wooden spoon. Awesome. Nice. Another something to add to the mantle. I'm Absolutely. sure you can pick that wooden spoon up brilliantly. I can spray <laughs> gold. It'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. Confuse yeah. people. Um, James, have you played anyone lately? Well, for me, the last games I got to play were at BrizCon, which was probably about five or six weeks ago now. Um, I don't get out to play many games. I spend most of my free time painting. Um, ended up going pretty well, though, at that event. Um, to my surprise, more than anyone else's, ended up getting four wins and a draw. So I was very impressed with my um, my form at that event. My friends have all told me that I'm now officially not allowed to tell them that I'm bad at Warhammer anymore. Dodgy, Dodgy, Dave, event. Dodgy Dave in the chat has said that you're the triple threat. You are painting sports and boss gamer. Is that true? Um, according to him, it is yes. So I'll, um, I'll wear that hat with pride as long as other people want to want to place it on my head. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and, and we had Dave Kerr on before um, talking about uh, BrizCon, which Liam and I both attended in the past, which is awesome. When, yeah. when it was quite small. Yes. We were OG. We were OG when, when the Sydney crew came up to Brisbane and uh, we, we had a bit of a state of origin. Uh, I, I wouldn't call it a match because it was a whitewash. Uh, but, I'm sure, but, but at the time it was. We, we, New South Wales challenged Queensland in, in game one and I think everyone won except one person. It was a, but, uh, but Queensland definitely has kicked up their game since then. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Trav, and, what would sorry, go James, go on. Sorry, I was just going to say it was a great event um, out at BrizCon. There were about a hundred players, I think, so it was a pretty sizable event um, in a ridiculously hot tin shed, as it tends to get in Queensland. So anyone that was at CanCon, it was that kind of experience. Um, yeah, sweltering heat, but it was it was a good day of playing with some war dollies. Good two days. Yeah, Solid. good event. Should come back up again for next year. Yeah, I, I would like to. I think um, there was an event on around the same time, and I think that's why we couldn't come up. But definitely, we had, like, we had Borders War. We had Travis's event. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, that's right. Should, we should have just cancelled Travis's event. Yeah, just and gone up. You know. Actually, no. I need Travis. Travis is bringing boards up for me. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Trev, what was your highlight of Slaughter? So obviously we had five games, so I, I probably probably won't have time to for all of us to go into our, our, our five games. But maybe yeah, maybe uh, the highlight from Liam, Travis, and I. Like, what was your highlight? Um, I um, so I got to play four people uh, that I've never played before, uh, which I always like playing new people. Um, and um, one of those games was against a guy named Ben, um, and it was. Um, he, he, he first when he first got to the table, he's sort of looking at me a bit funny, apparently, and he said, "You sound totally different because I, I, I sound odd when I uh, record for the, the podcast, the Heralds of War podcast." So I probably should have mentioned I'm part of, but anyway. Shout out to Heralds of War. If you're not listening to them, are you even in Australia? I do even have a phone. Uh, download this podcast. It is like it should be on the top. It should be a ringtone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a, a one and a half hour episode as your ringtone. Um, yeah, no, I um. Yeah, so I got to play against Ben, and I have to say it's probably one of the um, like the closest fought games of AOS that I've ever actually played. Um, like we were both right into it up till the very last dice roll, essentially, um, and it was just a really, really good game. Um, it, it was, like I say, hands down, probably one of the best games I've ever played. So um, that that'd be my personal highlight. Um, it was just a, a really solid game of AOS that I was like I'm thrilled to be part of. So. 
Um, yeah, that's it for me. And as I said, I got to pay uh, overall four new people who haven't played before, which is always good. Um, and um, yeah, it was it was a really good weekend. So Liam, what was your highlight? Uh, oh, probably the trivia. I think that was probably my highlight. It was just entertaining, just the questions, like how narrative you can make a Warhammer trivia, and I have no goddamn idea about... That's what, that's what I learned quite quickly. I know nothing about Age of Sigma narrative, and I'm so match play competitive because apparently I go, when I write down what are the three phases of the lore, and it's like Age of Chaos, Age of Myth, and Age of Myth instead of Age of Sigma, um, which is still quite embarrassing. Um, and I don't know apparently the casting value of one of my wizard's spells, so... That was a good highlight, but yeah, it was good. It was just awesome, fun of games. I got to play, I think I got to play four new people as well. Oh no, three new people, because I had Grudge, Dave Hurley, and I played Matt, and then, yeah, and I don't get to play Peter, but I got to play Brogan and Lockie um, from D3 Mortal Wounds, and those guys were absolute gents to play against. So, yeah, that was good. What about yourself, Anthony? Yeah, I think um, my highlight, uh, I... I Anyone who was around me at the time, um, it was definitely my highlight, which was Scarbrand killing 50, 56 of my grots uh, in one single round of combat. And uh, all I could do was laugh, but I threw inspiring presence down on him. I brought out five fanatics, absolutely carved up Scarbrand, and then I think went on and killed another bloodthirster or something. But uh, absolutely, I think very much like Travis, I play four uh, new opponents and I get to play Ken Van Ship again. Um, so he was my no, no, that, that that's it was a really good game. We had an awesome game at Border War, uh, an awesome game again. Um, and he was like, oh, I'm gonna get revenge for Border War, and unfortunately, uh, that didn't pay off. So uh, I'm pretty happy. Walked away with four wins and one loss. Uh, so it was good. Sorry. It was a really good event. Uh, and yeah. probably kind of sad that I'm probably not going to play another event until probably the Runax team event in November just because of Sydney GT. Yeah. Yeah. I was about to say there's Sydney GT, but you're running that. <laughs> I am running that. I, I'm, I can't play my own event. And I'm writing two and a half thousand point list, which is killing me because I want to play my own event. Yeah. I think you sent me like a full wizard army list. Was that right? It was like, a hell of a part, a full wizard list. Um, it's crazy. All the endless spells, all the humans, but it's going to be good. Um, but people don't want to hear about that. They want to hear about our guests. That's sweet. Easy. Um, let's get this started. I'll, before we do that, though, I wouldn't mind just throwing out a couple of quick shout outs to people who have created content. So uh, good Aussie content creators. So um, a couple of new um, videos on YouTube from um, Seraphim, uh, Measured Gaming, Doom and Darkness, and Cinderfall. Uh, they've all put out some really good content and in the show notes uh, below. Uh, you can find links to their content. Uh, and then uh, Heralds of War, Trav, you recently put out a podcast about Clint's epic adventure, uh, which is Warhammer Fest, Bobo, and, and, and Notorious GT. Uh, and then Shadowhammer yourself, Liam uh, has created content for the first time uh, in so long. It's February. Um, so and him long. and Hayden, or Elf Bro, uh, put out uh, a podcast about uh, their experience in New Zealand at Notorious. So check it out. And also some of the upcoming events, which is going to be Cinder 4 Gaming's got the narrative event, Ipswich GT's coming up uh, in July, uh, Bendigo Narrative. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff coming up. So, uh, so Lords of War in Melbourne have three or so tickets free left, a couple of dropouts. So they also got that happening next week. So yeah, just for heads up, if anyone wants a last minute tournament fix, uh, dwellers have a few tickets. So yeah. There you go. Oh uh, yeah. So do, do you want to do we want to talk painting? Let's, Let's talk it. painting because Liam, I'm wow. pretty sure you just summoned. You just started talking about Lords of War, and then Dwellers Below have just jumped in the chat. So I think you've just summoned uh, summoned the the Smorgan, or I don't know if it's who who it is, but you've summoned Dwellers. You know, I'm surprised I haven't summoned yet. You're going rogue because I've mentioned Hayden. He hasn't summoned him. Yeah. Um, let's see what we got here. Let's start talking painting. So what I might do is I might start off by sharing screen. So um, I had asked uh, Travis, Nat, and James to share um, some of their work uh, just so we can kind of show off 
uh, a little bit about what they're doing and, and kind of their background, um, and then kind of show off a, bit, a little bit of their sexy stuff. So uh, bear with me. Sweet. And this will kind of give a bit of context and flavor on um, some of their work. So um, Liam, do you want to kick this off? Sweet. Is this, this is James. Oh, your screen went black. I'll be back. Oh, there we go. Sweet. Cool. So James, how long have you been painting uh, miniatures for again? Uh, so 15 to 20 years. Like I said, there's a bit of a break in the middle there. But since I took painting back up, it's probably been the last sort of six to seven years um and only in the last couple i've really sort of started to look at really trying to push my painting forward um, to really improve um to where it's at today sweet um so do is there any place where you draw your most of your inspiration from with painting like is it like is it like artwork or is it like movies or anything that you see online when it comes uh, to like your painting okay because i see you got like because i see you have like blue scales that look like white walkers from like game of thrones and stuff yeah. so yeah uh most of my inspiration comes from other mini painters i would say i will look at what's out there we really do live in a great time for mini painting there's so much stuff on instagram twitter on youtube anywhere you want uh you can find it out there um so that's really where it comes from for me i look and see what other people have done with their minis i think it's pretty cool i need to try and give that same thing a go myself or use that as inspiration for my next projects yeah James, well, so, so, I, might, I might ask like the three guests when we get onto these slides, but um, why did you share these photos in particular? Like, what's the story and the narrative behind these ones of, uh, compared to all the others that you, you've probably taken and painted? So for these ones, I really wanted to sort of highlight the point that if you want to get better at mini painting, I think you really need to do two things. Um, one, you need deliberate practice and two you need feedback and and these are all sort of examples of mine where i've tried to to do those things so i guess from from the top left those storm casts there i wanted to practice non-metallic metals um so i watched some really good youtube videos um by painting buddha if no one's ever seen those you should go check them out they're a few years old now but they are excellent um and they go through painting non-metallic metal on a storm cast and i basically put the video on and followed along exactly what they were doing um really trying to you know actually practice um that particular element of the painting um for for some of the other ones there the the fast riders down below i really wanted to see how much the model i could airbrush um and for that one pretty much everything except the metals um are airbrushed on that model so all his armor on all the stuff on the base all the white that's on him parts of the bird his shoulder pads is all just being airbrushed because i wanted to like really work on my technique and my ability to actually target the airbrush where i wanted it to go so with, um, air, so, yeah, so with airbrushing you just constantly did the layers of airbrush so no actual brush was being used for the house yes right? so started off with the armor on that one because that's the biggest areas and then just angling the model in the direction i want you basically just keep using the airbrush to to layer it over i haven't really cut in any of the areas with the paintbrush on those so if you actually zoom in really close, you can see on their feet that there's a little bit where there's blue on the um, logs on the ground and a little bit of the yellow on their feet itself. Um, it doesn't really matter um, because it actually helps um, form some more harmony. Yeah, it kind of gives it like a shadow. It also gives like a bit of a shadow effect. Yeah, a little bit of a shadow and also helps sort of blend the pieces in together so the models look like they exist in the same space. They're not just dudes standing on a base They're in the sort of the same world. So... Yeah, that's what I was trying to do with those guys. So all of this, just you know, really practicing a specific thing, um, and then and then trying to get feedback on them as well, sharing them, talking to other people as well. Because when you start to get into that, you know, practice feedback loop, the quicker, sort of, the more times you can go through that loop, the faster you're going to get better. Okay, so that's like yeah. I guess the biggest takeaway I have from these. I might throw it over to Nat now to show off some of her work. So same, maybe Liam, same kind of questions. Yeah, sweet. Izzy, so Nat, how long have you been painting for now? Six years? Uh, was it? Yeah, so basically got handed the, my first model about six years ago. Um, it was my partner going, hey, I don't want to okay. paint my Necrons. Um, and <laughs> Are they the easiest well, yeah, model Yeah, but I didn't paint? paint them silver. Um, <laughs> okay, gotcha. But yeah, so I started back then, played around with it a bit, had a break, moved house, and then picked it up again about 
three years ago. Okay, sweet. Now I can see like there's varied color palettes and everything. So where do you draw most of your inspiration when it comes to like color palettes or like colors that you use? Um, like, is it like from what you see online or is it like, just? I mean, I like my lore just... a lot. Um, so yeah. a lot of the time what I'll end up doing is taking a color scheme and basically sort of transposing it sideways slightly. Um, yeah. So I'll you know, have a look at what it's meant to be like and then just see what part of that I might want to tweak to, you know, make it a little bit my own. Okay. Um, so, so even so, with the Eidneth. Oh, yeah? Yeah, cool. Because, like, with all these different images, so, like, why, why – similar question to Magro. Like, why did you pick these images, like, to show of, like, what you've been doing? Um, so it's a bit of a mix there. Um, so a, a couple of times I've been um, a while back, I was asked sort of what what defines what you do, and the answer was kind of excessive colors and freehand. Um, and yeah. you know these guys are all sort of very colorful in their own sense. The Navigator um, is one of my favorites from you know it's um, one of the models from Blackstone Fortress that came out, um, and that was quite literally just me going, I want to throw a whole bunch of color on this. Yeah. Um, and sort of, you know, without a color scheme in mind, just throwing things on there. Um, the Eidneth were, um, so the tide caller there, um, I'm pretty sure I was painting her in store when you were still there. Yeah, I remember um, I remember seeing her and also an Eidolon. Yeah, um, so that's sort of yeah. from a little while ago then. Um, but that one in particular was working with you know, different tones and sort of unusual tones on faces and things like that. So, um, yeah, skin tone. Yeah, cool, like, you did some cool skin tone. You also did makeup on her, I think you did. Yeah, like so, added stuff. yeah. Um, it was the it was idea insane. of using washes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just to go over and sort that. of constantly tint things back and forth and, you know, trying to convince you that was actually easier than it looked. Um, yeah. And, yeah, so um, bottom left is sort of, a, it's a bit of a wild card. Um, because that one's sort of the most freehand heavy model I've worked on recently. Um, so I don't know how well you can see it there on the photo, but that's... I was, uh, was going to ask, Magra, can you zoom into the Wood Elf type model? Yeah, absolutely. Well, spoiler. <laughs> Ruining Christmas for Travis. She, she's kind of this awesome um, sort of minotaur yeah. druid. Um, but her entire yeah, sort of yeah. skirt there is covered in freehand leaves um, that, you know, I've sunk a good probably about 10 hours into. God um, damn. That's but, awesome. You know, That's really, it's, God it's damn. awesome. Yeah. I, I, remember, I, remember, I remember seeing a lot of your freehand stuff for your Zinch collection and stuff, and I was like, I cannot do this. Um, and you're probably going to say, no, it's, it's easy. I'm like, no, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> I mean, yeah. look, it's easy if you put a lot of practice into it. Um, yeah. But it's where like I to, really um, sort of get to run away with it. into that makeup as well. Like, I think uh, you can see. Yeah, you can wow. see the makeup closely with the eyes. So, and also, yeah, I do remember seeing that model um, being like in person. I'm just like, okay, cool, sweet. <laughs> I was not expecting this. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. And then um, looks amazing, so, everything. And then also, I love the Stormcast. Yeah, that's the most recent thing. I that's love. literally, you know, the work in progress as of uh, yesterday. Yeah, um, it's where is it? Here we go. It's just there. Wow. Um, oh god. Also, on that note, the new scenery is huge. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so that's going to be sort of uh, my offering for Ever Chosen when it's all done. Okay, that's one big sixty mil. Yeah, one big it's, um, sixty mil. It's so it's going to be for the open category because that's the one I can compete in, sort of as a staff member. Okay. Um, oh, sweet. But it's it's just pushing the edge of that thirty by thirty box. Okay, cool. Because I do know that I was like giving model ideas to um Anthony. He goes, it has to be on sixty mil. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> yes. it has to be on sixties. Trav. Okay. So Trav. Yeah. Um, so pretty much, um, where did you draw most of your um inspiration for your work? Um. Most of the time is from, I, I always start, the armies I've started, I've started from a point of view of um, the the story I sort of put into them. But it does vary a little bit. Like 
Um, for example, I'll work right to left here. So I've actually broken the rules slightly on this Age of Sigma show. Um, obviously, the model on the right there is not Age of Sigma related at all. Um, so one of the first Are you things. Are sure? I thought, that was, I thought that was a Stormcast. Liam, do you want to get kicked off the show? Not quite. Um, no, no. One of the. <laughs> One of the um, one of the the first things I did uh, when I sort of seriously got into painting, and something I always wanted to do when I was much younger, um, was to paint a um, like super crisp, super clean ultramarine arm. Um, so I did. Uh, I painted yeah. about fifteen, sixteen hundred points or so of them, um, and that was was really an exercise for me in. Um, uh mostly in brush control um and and just being really steady with how i actually paint the model um yeah. now so the inspiration for that one that is literally textbook textbook funny is um you know uh codex is starting was called um straight up yeah. color scheme so there was no real sort of inspiration behind that other than i knew i wanted to do an ultramarines army um the sylvaneth force i have which is represented here by the next model across by the um the law master um, who's, who's been converted and chopped in half and added a banshee lower half onto them. Um, it was, that's, thing, that's where so I clean. Yeah. So I wanted to, I still had that sort of, I wanted to do a really clean army, but um, they're mostly, and that model's probably a bad one to demonstrate it actually, but mostly they're, um, it's a working gray. So I wanted to do yeah. a, um, uh, uh, and, I, and the inspiration for that essentially came from some trees. There's a particular type of tree I remember I found photos of. I can't remember the type of tree now, but um, it's a, a, a very light grey tree. Um, I always think it's the Japanese one, but it's not. It's some 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 random tree I found online, but I thought, yep, yeah. that's the type of look I wanted to have. Um, and on the more um, tree-like models, so like the tree lords and stuff like that, I've tried to sort of copy the bark, I guess, in essence. Yeah. Um, and then moving across, so as we've mentioned, I have a Slaves to Darkens army. So there's two models there from that. Um, there's the uh, the Chaos Sorcerer Lord, who is actually, again, a 40K model that's been um, extensively changed so that he um, fits in with the army. Um, he's uh, uh, the Primaris Chaplain, I think he's called. But, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Um, with a, with a basically bashed together with the normal Chaos Sorcerer Lord kit so that he... Um, fits a little bit more and as you can see there he's got like the sort of the ball of you know blue fire or magic or whatever you want to call it in his hand there um yeah. and and i sort of started to you know play around with some object source lighting um so obviously yeah. it sort of lights up the uh, i don't know if this is mirrored or not but it lights up the side that's obviously blue. yeah and are those uh, stormcast shoulder pads on the side as well yeah so he has stormcast shoulder pads instead of the normal ones um, yeah. And I think that's the actual only Stormcast bits on that model from memory. Yeah. Um, I think the rest of this, because the, the Primaris Chaplain armor is not that similar to their normal that's armor anyway. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And then the last one across there on the bottom left, um, here we have a, uh, a Bloodstoker who has been converted out of the um, the original Lord Ordinator model. So he's, um, he's, he's had his... Um, his arm swapped out, his head obviously, his shoulder pads. I took away some of the Stormcast iconography and basically just covered him in skulls. Um, yeah. And then, um, yeah, sort of put him together. And that was the, 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 what I, the main thing I wanted to do with that army, um, similar to what James was talking about before, um, it, this is the first army where I've really tried to make use of my airbrush. Um, I, I've always had, I've had one for a while, um, but it's um, I usually generally just use it for like base colors and stuff like that. I never really did anything um, you know fancy with it I spray one color and then put it away and never touch it again by the time I was finished um, yeah. so that uh, it's a bit hard to tell from that particular photo and it blurs a little bit on my end I'm sure it will on everyone else's as well but um, it's 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 I've, I've tried to get like the light to dark happening on their armor yeah um, and then it's the last one nice red so yeah yeah, it's a really deep red that I've used, almost down to black at the feet. Yeah, um, it's awesome. That, that's what I was now, aiming for. Now the final model? Yeah, so the last one top left there is just something I started doing probably two years ago, 18 months ago. I just started um, sort of experimenting with random techniques, I guess. Um, I've always sort of looked at non-metallic metal and just gone, nah, no way, that's not happening. Um, yeah. But I, it's something I wanted to sort of pick up. I actually used the same video that James used, um, so by painting Buddha. Um, 
uh, it, it's it's an eight part thing that runs for hours and I literally just had the video on repeat as I went through each step so I would just sit there and every now and then I'd just take wind it back 10 minutes because I, I wanted I was still halfway through that that bit yeah. um, and I, I basically so I painted uh, again another 40k model but um, the major general captain general Valor or whatever his name is from the Custos so he's actually got full gold armor and stuff um, yeah, so that, that's, it, that was, I guess, uh, exploring a particular technique, uh, which I've since started to use again on some new stuff, which isn't in any of these photos. But um, um, so now I'm, I'm sort of getting a bit more confident with it and I'm confident enough to not just apply it to a single model, but to actually have a go at applying it across a whole army. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And the other awesome. thing I wanted to do with that one as well, um, and this is why I've chosen this particular photo, um, is I really wanted to work on faces. So I'm yeah. actually I'm, I'm quite happy with how his face came out. Um, it's you know you can see his eyes, he's looking in the right direction, stuff like that. So um, that's something I wanted to to practice for him as well. So yeah, amazing. Cool. Love it. So maybe an open question to everybody would be, um, how on earth do you stay motivated on these these one singular models? You know, working through the pain of, of failing and, and doing something and it doesn't work or, you know, like painting is, is a frustrating but a very rewarding journey. So I guess, you know, how do you stay motivated in this process? James? Um, all right. So for me, um, I tend not to rely on motivation. Um, everyone's only really got so much motivation. Like whenever we start a new hobby project, we're always very excited and we're really motivated and we put lots of effort in, but then that invariably tapers off and sort of goes away a little bit until, you know, a couple of weeks before the tournament's happening and oh crap, I've got to paint everything again. Um, so for me, it's more about building the habit of painting. Like I've got a habit at the moment, I'm actually painting every day, get home from work after do dinner, put the kids to bed, etc. I then go and paint after that for a few hours. Um, I don't always paint every day that does vary, but that's sort of the habit I'm into. That's sort of the time that I paint. So that's essentially what I do. I try, try not to rely on motivation. Um, yeah. try to rely on building those habits. Okay. So like, you never really feel like putting yourself on a deadline or anything helps. No, it does. Whenever I've got a like rush to get models finished for an event that's coming up, I really don't like that. Like yeah. it will force me to paint more, but it's a very uncomfortable space for me. I will use tournaments as sort of goals or painting comps to get models finished, but I don't like sort of that that mad rush that can often happen at the end. Cool. So they're more sort of longer term goals, not not daily um, I like motivations. That. I like that. Do you feel the same? Um, I uh, just trying to think. It's. I work in a slightly different environment because I'm commission painting a lot of the time. Um, so I need to stick by deadlines. Um, but at the same time, I try and, you know, where possible, make sure that I've got enough space where I can do what I call hobby butterfly, um, which is basically, you know, just flicking from project to project. So, you know, at any one point, if I tr start to get burnt out on one or you know, reach that point where I'm painting and I'm just frustrated and, you know, I'm just really not digging it anymore. Um, I'll quickly flick to another one, you know, grab a random model, just throw paint on there and just try to get some, you know, some fresh eyes, fresh fingers. Sweet. Awesome. Travis? Um, I'm, I'm very similar to James, I think, in this regard. I, I really dislike um a tournament is an arbitrary deadline like i have done it um and it, but it's not something i enjoy at all so i don't like going okay i have to get this model painted like because it's the night before i'm about to get on a plane or whatever um i'm more uh long-term goals as well so like right now i know what i want to do for cancon 2020 um i know what army i want to take and i've started it um I know I've got you know seven months or whatever it is to do it, um, and that's the sort of time frame I want to put on myself. Um, and that might seem like an insanely long amount of time for people who are going, but I want to have my army ready next week. Um, and you know that that's fine, but for me, that's how I enjoy painting. Um, yeah. Up until 
a few weeks ago up until I moved house about a, six weeks ago now but up until then I the other thing I was trying to do this year was just trying to do um, some sort of hobby every day um, and I did manage to keep it going all the way up until then but the house move just kind of shot it to bits so I'm getting back into it now um, even if that just means I spend 10 minutes putting you know one color on the the shields of these guys sitting on my desk or um, you know obviously on the weekend I went and played at a tournament but um, you know, I, I try to squeeze in just a little bit just to try and build that habit um, because sometimes it is hard to get into it. Um, it is hard to find motivation to do stuff. Um, and the other big one for me is um, is I love having um, some sort of um, creative background noise in a sense. Yeah. Um, so you know, I'll put like a podcast on. It's a great time to listen to something like that or I might catch up on one of the streams or something. Um, doesn't even have to be wargaming related, but something that I can um, sort of just have on in the background just to keep things flowing, I guess. Um, that, that's it for me. Yeah, so it's, it's cool. It's, guys. Sorry, Liam, go on. I was just going to say it's pretty cool that, like, it sounds like from Travis and James, it's like sounds like stress free. Like, I think for me recently with painting, I always put myself on a ridiculous deadline, but it, painting becomes a chore. If that makes sense like it very much becomes like i have to get this done or else i won't make it for the event but um mm -hmm. i like their way of doing it so it's so much stress free it's good yeah it, yeah I, i'm fascinated because you probably hear in the wargaming community that events drive that deadline and you know when i submit that list i know i've got x time um to paint that up and uh painting the night before is very common in our scene and um to hear from these three professional painters the schedule uh, it's the constant working on it every day. Travis, I know on Twitter yourself, and I think it's Steve Herner, have a, a daily post where they, they do like a, no matter what you guys paint, you you paint like a a, a, a once a day. Trav, you want, you want to explain a little bit more? I'm, I'm kind of butchering this. Yeah, so I, it was something I was doing. I, I always put like a hashtag daily hobby on it thing. Uh, I know there's a few variations of it. So I know people do like hobby streak. Um, so there's a couple of people I follow that have like, you know, hobby streak day 157 and whatever. Um, you know, so they're trying to just do something every day, even, and it doesn't have to be much, you know, it doesn't mean you have to sit down for three hours and have like, you know, this epic painting session where you finish a whole unit or anything like that. You know, some of my, um, some of my daily hobby updates were because I, I, I came home from work, got everything sorted, kids to bed, whatever, and then sat down for, 10 minutes and, and filed up some models, you know, I, I, you know, assembled five guys. It's not, it's not a huge investment of time on a daily basis, but it's more about, um, I guess, just the habit of, of actually doing stuff. Um, yeah. Interesting that you talk about like the stress part of it. For me, it's actually the opposite um, is I actually find it as a, I, I find just sitting, sitting here and actually working on models and stuff to be a stress relief rather than a stress creator. Um, but it does depend why, uh, as far as the event deadline stuff go, it depends why you want to go. So obviously the, the, the time frame that I've described and that we all of us are describing um, for, for getting ready for an event, I'm talking about getting ready for an event in seven months. Um, we all know there's going to be a general's handbook in, I don't know, what, a couple of weeks' time. So yeah. stuff I've gone, hey, this is what I'm going to paint. I have no idea what it will be like in seven months' time. So if you're if you're goal is to go to that event to be competitive and have a new you know on the cutting edge army that's okay and it's nothing wrong with that but um you know having set saying setting yourself a six or seven month you know deadline to finish the army may not be compatible with that yeah because they just don't mesh and you might get lucky and get something that fits both bills but um you know i, I the army I, i'm planning on taking i have no idea if it'll be any good in, in seven months time but i'm not really worried about that so it's just personal choice i guess yeah amazing so um is there any like so do you guys like set hobby goals throughout the year pretty much like when you're like for example i know you guys were like saying you want to learn like non-metallic metals so do you like say like okay i'm gonna have a project that has this skill involved or like for example you guys are talking about using the airbrush more or anything so is there any like hobby goals that you do um for that or like you want to meet a certain event like armies on parade and stuff like i know nat you always have something planned for armies on parade like even the day after the last armies on parade yeah yeah um that's absolutely a thing for me i um i try to use armies on parade as sort of my beat project for the year um ever chosen may throw a bit of a spanner in the works for that one um but otherwise 
I try to use it as in the you know a chance to explore new skills. Um, so last year, for example, I did um, you know a 40k piece. Um, ended up you know using my trip to Weta Workshop over in New Zealand as sort of a springboard to get into making sort of really lovely, large, realistic sort of diorama scenes. Um, so everything from twisting my own wire trees to, you know, sculpting rocks, things like that. Mm. Sweet. Yeah, for me, similar to, to Travis, I have a goal for CanCon 2020. Um, I've also started my army for that. Um, and I'm actually worried that it's not going to be enough time. Um, seven months, I have some pretty crazy plans, I think, at the moment for a, a display board. Um, that's something which I really want to work on getting better at this year. I've only ever made one display board before, so that's something that I want to try and push my hobby in for a direction for this year. But outside of that, I'll use painting competitions when they're coming up. If I really want to try out some new skills or really push um, in a certain direction, obviously with the ever chosen competition coming up, that's pretty exciting. Although it's a bit of a bummer because that's falling on the same weekend as the Ipswich GT, which is really close to me. So I'm not going to be able to attend that one now, which is a bit of a shame, but yeah, as I mentioned before, just having sort of those bigger sort of goal posts is handy. Um, just don't want them crammed up right next to, to my schedule when it's happening right now. Give myself yeah. the time to get the things done. Uh, as Travis said, it is a relaxing experience for me, something fun you do to unwind and have a creative outlet. So don't want to be piling this extra stress on top of that of having these mad deadlines to meet. I've seen yeah. some um, interesting people on Twitter and on, on TGA and other places around uh, the internet where they've set themselves a goal where it might be at the start of the year, their new year's resolution is to paint a hundred models through the year, or they've, uh, they've, you know, uh, I think James Mabry, for example, had the goal this year of painting the gash. He's a, you know, a very proficient death painter, but he's never painted the gash. So, uh, having those aspirational models like, uh, Archeon, uh, Nagash, uh, Lariel. Gabe had something similar. Gabe had, um, he wanted to paint he really wanted to avoid um as like he doesn't want gray plastic around his house anymore so he wanted to like paint a number of models to get him out of that gray plastic stuck if that makes sense mm. yeah 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 but do, do you guys have something similar like you just like uh, setting goals like that? the inspirational models i can see that working because you know you have that nice big centerpiece for your army but i've never been one to sort of approach that i want to paint like a hundred models in in this amount of time or this period it doesn't really i guess it's not really what my goal is like just like every hobbyist i have a million unpainted models sitting in my house still um but since i don't get out for a lot of games there's no real pressure on me to get those done to go and play games with them so i'll just sort of paint at the pace that I want to paint at, I don't really mind having the gray plastic sitting around here. It's not bothering me too much yet. <laughs> All right. So this Matt. might sound like a weird question. Um, where do you guys paint? Now, like I'm talking like physical location because uh, like this, <laughs> like and, and there's, 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 there's method yeah. to the madness. Um, I've got a room set up for it effectively. Um, so, you know, it's the room I've got behind me. You've got like the, the stuff shelf here. Um, but, you know, this room is basically, you know, it's 80% hobby, you know, say 10% um, computers and 10% bird. Um, and that's where pretty much everything goes on. Otherwise, I'll head out to stores, but that's sort of, you know, obviously, if you're painting other people's models as well, you never really want to take that, uh, uh, the chance to, you know, accidentally get it sat on by someone on the train or, you know, knocked on your way into the store. Um, so most of it's all here. So maybe, <laughs> maybe, Travis, I'll ask yourself, uh, continuing, uh, is it important to find a space that you, you paint and uh, is it important to have like a, a, a space that you constantly come back to, like, a, like a, you know, your painting desk or uh, having the routine of going to a games workshop to, to paint, like, or... Are you someone who just grabs wherever they can and they paint uh, and they just kind of steal those moments? Um, personal choice for each person, obviously. But um, for me, I I like having my um, sort of hobby space set up where I where I have all my stuff. Um, at the moment, um, it's it's a 
blank room um, because I said we moved house about six weeks or so ago now. I haven't quite got around putting it all back together yet. Um, but um, for the moment, I'm just tucked in the corner of our spare room. But uh, in another couple of weeks, I have to have it all set up. Um, I like to have my desk. Uh, so I guess in that regard, I'm very organised. There is a cupboard you can see behind me here, which I've currently just stuffed all my boxes into. And I'm trying to keep that pile as small as possible. Um, but um, for, in terms of actual project I'm working on, I'm very much a sort of, here's my desk and it's, and that's that's the stuff I'm doing sort of thing. Um, so for me, I, I like to have my sort of dedicated space for it. I don't mind going to paint somewhere else, but I tend to find I'm not really as, um, not comfortable, but I, I don't mind doing it, but it's not, it's not optimal for me. Um, and, you know, some people are different. Some people will just smash stuff out wherever they sit. They can sit, um, you know, in the corner of some random room in an event or something like that and still paint a model. Um, but that's just not for me. Um, you know, I, I prefer having a dedicated space definitely for it. I know. I know for myself personally, I actually paint in the lounge room uh, with my wife. So my wife doesn't hobby, but uh, I paint in the lounge room um, with the dog and the wife. So I'm not spending too much time away um, from my loved ones. But I know Liam... Um, you go into places like Games Workshop or have in the past and you you do a lot of hobby um, yeah. there. So for me, I do my hobby um, either, it all depends really on like time of the year and stuff and like also what's going around. Um, I think so like when some of my mates who are like having quiet times at work and stuff, we would just like meet up at a store and just like paint and stuff. But generally my creative, like where I do my stuff is generally at home, like my building and stuff because I'm like do it where I do my photo editing. So I like, it's just like, um, I have like my screens and everything, like the way it's like laid out. Can't really show it cause I have to pick up my laptop, but I have like all my paints and all my photography stuff, all like pretty much everywhere, but it's like my creative juice area in that sense. But um, generally I do enjoy painting with others because you get to talk and you also get to share skills. Like I paint with Dan Brewer, who I think some of you guys may know of, that's like a pretty darn good painter. Mm -hmm. um, he does some awesome stuff. So like just painting with him and then be like, Hey dude, I stuffed up, help me here. But that's the only times really, but generally I just paint at home and I kind of like opposite to you, Magro at times I do want to be by myself in my own little world, like have my headphones in and just be like zone out. Um, just, yeah. Cause it's awesome. Well, you know, like when you realize that it's like 4am in the morning and you're still painting. So yeah, which I'm sure most right. of us have done. I feel like James is, uh, has, moved his monitor specifically to show us something yeah so this is my my hobby space where i'm sitting at the moment just like trav i do like to have a uh, space set up specifically for hobby i know where all my stuff is all my bits and pieces are everything just feels nice and comfortable um i normally dislike going and painting other places like i've done it before you go to a gw or another local game store and everything just feels weird the desk is a different height the lights are all funny you, the, everything's just not quite the same and so for me it gets very distracting the the best part of painting with other people as as liam mentioned is actually talking to each other and getting feedback on models um i find for myself i'm happy to do that with other people i don't really need to be painting as well at the same time to, to have those conversations with folks. Um, so yeah, I definitely like having a space set up for hobby. And yeah. something that you've also brought up, sorry, something that else that James brought up is like, yeah, when you go to a store like GW and stuff, the lighting isn't really made for painters, does that make sense? <laughs> like it's yeah. not, like no. it's, it's a weird mixture of like natural light and artificial light and you're just like, I can't pick. Um, so that's, yeah, I've been trying to avoid it now because recently since I want to get better at painting, I want particular lighting to look like look at particular lighting. Does that make sense? Like I, have I, my, I like, guess. Ones. Yeah. I guess the logic behind calling it out here was, uh, for some people, they potentially could be easily distracted, and you know, time that they've dedicated to painting, they they play video games, they watch Netflix or YouTube. So by removing themselves and and going to a location such as a games workshop they may find them more productive or for someone who's I, looking for real time feedback or, Hey, I don't know how to do a technique. There might be a, a store manager or, or a painter who could also provide them that real time feedback. But I can see Travis, uh, this is, this is very much a let's show everyone our hobby space and Trav's got something for us. But I guess the point I'm trying to make here is um, think about the location where you're most productive and you're going to get the most value. And if you are trying a new technique, find people where, you can be social or 
you know, share photos on Twitter and get real time feedback. But Trav, what are you going to show us? Uh, so this is my temporary setup at the moment, but I have this sort of long desk. There's actually another bit that goes here, but it's just not in at the moment. So I wouldn't be able to open the door. But um, I like to have everything sort of laid out. So usually, typically, once the other part of the desk here is here, um, oddly, some people might find this really daunting, but I actually have the whole army, if it's an army I'm working on, sitting on that desk, regardless of what state it's in. Um, so even though it might look... Um, and it sometimes does at the start when you've basically got, you know, a whole army of unpainted models just sitting there waiting to go. Um, but that's, I guess, how I sort of work through it. And, and it, you get sort of better as you get closer and closer to the finish. It looks like you're you know, making this massive rate of progress. Um, but it's that's, I guess, my sort of setup. Everything, everything nicely laid out. And what you can't see underneath here um, is... Um, there's, there's drawers and stuff with all paints and supplies and all that obviously in there as well. But um, that's my normal setup, just temporarily for the moment. Before uh, before Liam asks the next question, can I get you to explain, Travis, there's something there that uh, some people might be wondering what the hell's going on, and that is your Stormcast shields are separated from the model. Now, that's a term that uh, some people may be familiar with called a sub-assembly. So why would you why would you subassemble? And, and I guess this is uh, for anyone actually. Why would you subassemble a model and paint them separately as opposed to gluing it all together and then painting it all in one go? Um, so the particular the reason why I've done it in this particular case is because of the way I've um, painted the. Um, so this is I don't even know if you'll be able to see this properly, but um, so the way I've painted the. Don't know if it's actually going to focus, but eh, it's not. We'll get that. Um, but basically, the the way I've painted the um, the non-metallic metal parts of it um, of the model was originally done with the airbrush, like the first couple of colours. Um, so because of that, I left off the shoulder pads and the shields. The shoulder pads got glued on very soon after they were airbrushed, but the the shields themselves have just stayed separate, just for accessibility of of um, accessibility of being able to get to certain parts of the model underneath um, and I guess more for um, having to avoid um, you know, crossing out uh, or masking out a bunch of extra st extra areas when I'm, when I'm spraying stuff on them. I, I could have probably glued them on a long time before now. Um, I just haven't gone around to it more than anything else. But, um, yeah, so I guess it's if you, you can do it for accessing parts of the model that might be difficult to otherwise access, um, uh, which sometimes is pointless if you're not going to see that part of the model later. But um, certainly in some cases, it, it's definitely a useful thing to do. Um, it's, you know, simple physics says it's hard to get the brush in the right place sometimes. So, you know, that, that's, that's certainly something you can do if you feel it's necessary. Yeah. And I also see, James, you've been doing that with your demon hats. Um, yeah, so they're pretty much all together, just they're separate from their bases. I generally like to, oh, excuse me, um, paint models separately to their bases. Um, just makes it easier. The models are normally a different color to the base. It's probably going to be hard to see coming through so, there. Yeah, because I messaged Magro, I think it was yesterday, was it? Magro, when I said, where yeah. can I get cork heads? Because I literally started seeing your stuff on Twitter where you like started posting like all these demonets on cork. I'm like, okay, where do I get them? Where's the nearest store? He goes eBay. So I literally just impulse bought cork heads because of you. So James um... is showing, I think James, if he talks. Yeah. Sorry. So yes, I, I get mine from my wife whenever a bottle of champagne gets drunk in this house. Um, not a lot of champagne actually gets drunk here. So it's a pretty long process. It's taken me about nine months, I think, to get up to almost 20 corks at the moment. Um, but yeah, you can definitely just buy them individually or separately I, as well. I just I just bought a box of fifty. I was like done. Yeah, so, yeah. So you guys we all saw on, we saw on James and Travis's desks, and I'm sure um, Nat has it as well. The GW handles, uh, and unfortunately, when I'm painting forty to sixty grots, I'm not going to buy sixty uh, of those GW handles. But uh, I remember seeing um, Brett, um, who's an amazing Sydney-based painter, um, who who had those corks. Uh, I'm sure it's a very common technique, but I went onto eBay, 20 bucks, and I got about 50 or 60 um, champagne cork bottles. Uh, well, not the bottles, just the, the caps or the corks. And um, a little bit of blue tack, as James showed, and um, 
and like James or Nat, like what's the what's the benefit? Like I find it's it's a bit easier to hold compared to like holding it by the base. Um, yeah. Um, so just holding them, especially if you're painting for longer amounts of time, just it avoids things like hand cramps if you're holding, especially twenty five mil bases. If you're holding those for hours on end, your hand's going to start cramping up. It's just going to get really uncomfortable. Um, another trick that I use is that if you do prefer, especially if you've got sort of mobility issues with your hands or sort of things like that, where holding something smaller for longer amounts of time is quite uncomfortable, um, what you can always do is I've gotten a whole bunch of corks and basically just slice them um, and glue them onto bases. So I can basically hot swap anything I would normally sort of pin into a cork or something like that. Um, but I can still use that handle. Okay. Yeah, because I've got it because I'm going to about paint the, about 50 witch shells and all this stuff, and I just need, and I'm doing the bases separately. So, yeah, it was. I thought when I saw you guys start doing it with cork instead of using the GW handles, I was like, yep, done. I need them. But, yeah, so the next question is, is there any theories that you guys follow, like rules and theories when it comes to painting, i.e. the color wheel, color theory? um okay well for me i guess one of the main rules i try and follow when i paint is avoid using black and white as much as possible um now to explain i don't mean don't paint white miniatures or black miniatures if anyone's seen my corn army they've got primarily white armor but when you said that i was like <laughs> corn white yes no my point <laughs> is is don't use pure white or pure black paint um mostly because one they're not actually colors um and two you can't go anywhere from those two colors. Like if you paint something black, you, you can't shade it because there's nowhere else to go. Or same thing with white, you can't highlight it because there's nowhere else up to go. So I avoid putting those things on my models as much as possible. And I'll use things that are near black or near white instead. Um, any kind of light colors like ivories or really light blues, uh, light flesh tones are good. For your dark colors, you've got things like Dark Sea Blue from Vallejo, which is excellent. Um, Incubite Darkness from Citadel is sort of similar, a little bit brighter. Um, some really dark reds as well. Um, so really, like I said, get away from black and white. Use more colors. On my corn army, there's no actual white paint on those at all, apart from on the weapons, a very tiny bit on the very edges. So It's all other you're... color. So you kind of like use shades though, right? Like your grays and everything, like lighter grays and everything to kind of get a white effect? Yeah, I can still use grays. So for the armor for those guys, there is browns to start it off with. I use ivories to highlight. There's blues and greens in the washes for that armor. Um, again, more ivories to highlight it up. So just using all sorts of other paints, not the black and the white. And if we talk about color theory a bit later, I'll talk about that more when we bring the wheel up. But yeah, that's sort of one of my main rules I try and stick to. Use more color. Sweet. Matt? Um, yeah, so I like my background is doing graphic design and things like that. And I've got sort of a traditional art sort of backgrounds before that as well. Um, so, you know, I've had, you know, all the design principles sort of, you know, beaten into my head six ways from Sunday. Um, so, you know, a lot of that does play in sort of in an unconscious kind of way. Um, in that, you know, things like color theory, which we'll get to later, um, but especially, you know, ignoring the sort of, you know, the obvious crossover with the paint name now, it's, um, you know, contrast is a massive thing. Um, and, you know, I always employ, you know, a, a couple of sort of little mantras, which is, you know, um, yeah, if you've got the option, hobby smart, not hard. You know, yeah. if you can, if you can cut corners, get the same result and spend more time doing what you want to do um you know why not do it um and also just make sure that you know you have enough contrast on your model whether it be through color or through value um so your light to dark or the actual colors you're using um that you can still see everything really well um you know when you're holding the miniature out sort of at arm's length yeah okay. um, and then, uh, sorry go on oh it's that'll just make a massive difference not only on the tabletop but you know, when you're sort of getting that first impression of the model as well. Yeah, I remember um, talking to Vince Venturella at Adepticon and he was talking about, you know, these different rules where, you know, it's, um, you know, making sure the model looks good from not, not only near, but also far. So, you know, if you if you look really closely, can, does it look good? He had, he had a theory, like a three-step theory. I'm sure if you jump on his channel, um, you'd find more about what I'm talking about. But just having that 
that uh, that peace of mind of making sure that it looks really good at a distance as much as it looks just as good uh, when you're close up. Um, maybe speaking of contrast paints, I don't know, and Nat, I know you've tried it, Nat, uh, Liam, I know you've tried it today. Um, Trav, James, uh, I guess broad question, as advanced painters, do you see yourself using the GW contrast paints? And if so, what situations or at what stages of the, I guess, your painting journey do you currently see using the, the, the contrast paints? Um, I haven't had a chance to try them out yet. Um, I haven't, I'm not sort of geographically close to a store that's easy to pop in. Um, but uh, so I haven't had a chance to actually try them out yet. But I, from what I'm seeing people do with them, um, I don't know if I'll, I mean, it's hard to say without having to having actually used them, but I don't know if I'll paint a whole model with contrast paints. I know some people are, but I just I don't know if that'll suit my style. Um, maybe it will once I get my hands on. Maybe I'll try it out and decide that this is the best thing ever, and I'm never going to go back. Um, but I I can sort of see myself doing um, essentially replacing base color work with it. I guess. Um, but I, 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 as I said, it might all change once I've actually got them in my hands and give it a shot. But uh, that's where I can sort of see myself going with it. Um, what I am really interested to see is in probably three months' time, once um, you know some of the quite of the big name, famous painters around the world have had a chance to sort of really sit down and see what you can actually do with them. Once you get past, um, you know, I spray coat. whatever the thing color can is, and then put one sort of thick coat over the top. Like I'm really keen to see what people do if they start blending them together or mixing them together or, you know, uh, applying it in different ways or something like that. So I, I think there's a lot of potential there. And it was just like the current paints, I guess, um, you know, over time people will develop new ways to use them. But I'm you know, really excited to see what comes out of them. Nat, I know you've got experience and I'll ask James uh, if he's ha had a play yet. But Nat, I know you've played around with them so far. Where do you see the value of these coming in um, as an advanced painter? Um, I I really like them. Um, so I had a chance to play with them for a few hours on last Saturday, I believe. Um, and they work really well as a base, you know, beginner to sort of intermediate painters. They, they work really well to get that really quick, easy result. Um, but I found that they behave a lot like things like, you know, glazes and inks that I'm already working with. Um, and what that says to me is that I can start sort of replacing um, things like glazes that I have to mix or things that I'm already using um, with the contrast paints and effectively use them as dual purpose. Um, the first thing I did, you know, as, as you do effectively, um, is I tried to throw together some non-metallic metals with it um, and, you know, three paints and I was, you know, halfway there to a really, really lovely gold non-metallic. Uh, we've already seen, like, Darren Latham, absolutely, yeah. you know, absolute champion, has done a full sort of step-by-step -step on how he did non-metallics with, you know, effectively nothing but contrast paints with, you know, a bit of white thrown in there. Um, and I can see them really complementing pretty much any sort of intermediate plus skill set with, you know, with the role of more glazing than as the, you know, battle-ready contrast theme. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I've got, I've had about half an hour to play around with them. The picture on the slide you showed earlier um, of the Stormcast model, that was me playing with the contrast paints last weekend. Um, similar to Travis, I think for base coating, there's definitely uh, potential there um, for integrating with the way I paint. Um, it's going to be hard because in half an hour, I couldn't really get a good sense for how they would, you know, properly integrate into into my system but as far as just being a product that's out there that, exi that exists I'm, I'm very excited i think it will really help bring the base level of hobby up for a whole lot of people so i'm excited to see what armies look like going to tournaments in the future if it's going to just be bringing everybody's army up to everything looks like it's had base coat shade highlight on it sort of with that one step um, all the armies are just going to look that much better on the table, um, which is the best part of going to events for me, looking at other people's sweet armies. So I'm very excited that they're out there and they, they exist. No, great, Sorry. great. I, I, I'm imagining, I haven't played with it yet, so, we, so Liam and I were both at a, at a tournament over the weekend, but I imagine that it might. this is one of the many tools that can kind of save us time and 
allow us to reinvest that time into more edge highlighting, you know, spending the proper amount of time on, on the eyes or the faces of models. So, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that, that they really do is they give you a pretty decent looking result very quickly which is really good positive feedback for people. You know, when you sit there and you first start to paint a model, you're like, oh my God, this entire thing's gray. And then you're sitting there and you're painting on this base coat and it still doesn't look very good. Um, and you sort of got to go through all these steps before the model starts looking nice. Whereas with the contrast paints, that part can happen really quickly. So that can be really motivating for people um, to help them actually push through and get their models finished, um, so which I think would be really good. I know when I'm painting models and stuff and I'm putting down the base coats and everything, like two thin coats, et cetera. When I wet blend everything, I'm still looking I'm like, it's so flat. I don't like it. Once yep. I put the shade on, then you go, oh, cool. I'm happy. Like that's mm. sorted. Um, playing with contrast today, it does have that effect where you feel good straight away. Yep. Um, but yep. yeah, like it. it's, I'm excited to see everyone's tutorials on it and their experience with it. I know Tyler Mangle is showing some stuff now and he's killing it already. Yeah. Doing some cool stuff. But yep. um, right now, I think for the biggest thing for me is, yeah, it's just, get, and as you said, getting people to like tabletop, like a good stage quite quickly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's going to be excellent. I mean, as people want to start getting more advanced in their painting, I, I try and get them to to make sure you're moving away. It doesn't matter what the models look like as you're painting it but you know if you're trying to get things tabletop ready getting that good result really quickly will, will be really motivating and i think you know that's sort of being undersold a bit at the moment which i think is going to be really positive yeah and i think if it's something that makes the hobby more accessible for more people then it can't be a bad thing yeah no i i, I agree um i think it's going to be good uh, not no, this is obviously not the gw contrast show but i really wanted to while um it's a hot topic to get your experience and just your initial thoughts. Um, assuming that people have paint and brushes, so, you know, they're very basic stuff. What are, what are some of the other foundational tools that uh, I should own as a painter, uh, whether it's foundational or even some more of the advanced stuff? You know, I know things that are very quick to, to be purchased are things like um, medium. Um, I saw in the chat people were calling out, I think it was Travis's uh, wet palette. Um, what are some of those other tools that you guys would recommend that uh, somebody who wants to improve their painting um, goes on and purchases at some point in time? It, I did see in the chat that popped up. Someone says that's a, I've got it here, something about that's a very interesting wet palette. Um, so it is a, um, to, I know you can buy like proper ones that come in cases and have a like, you know, I'm sure scientifically engineered sponge and whatever. <laughs> this is literally a $2 serving plate from Kmart. Um, I might move the camera around as I speak, but um, it's a it's a two dollar it's a two dollar serving plate from Kmart. So it's a flat rectangular dish. Um, I put um, kitchen cloth, so paper towel in there, and fill that with water, and then cover it with baking paper. It works exactly the same as as any commercial one will. I'm sure someone will argue against me on this, but I'm telling you it does. Um, so, what? you know, that cost me all of five bucks to put together um, and a five minute roll of paper last me 10 years. But um, it basically, it, for me, it was actually born out of necessity more than anything else. Um, when I was um, started picking up painting again, when I moved to where I am now, it can be quite cold. I believe it's about one degrees outside at the moment. Um, but um, which means I got the heater on in the house, um, and I found that the the heater, which was a vent right above my head just there, will dry the pallet out if I don't use one. Um, so it was actually more out of necessity originally than than anything else. But once I actually got into it, um, I found it actually does just make things easier. So um, maybe the makes... elevator pitch before I then ask Natalie uh, what what one of her tip uh, tools would be. Is why why does somebody or what's the benefit of a of a wet palette? Um, so it lets you do stuff like um, blending colors and stuff a lot easier because obviously you you paint. So the paint for, for a game, for example, here. Um, let's just see. Yeah. So I've got paint that I was using last night um, that's still wet on the palette right now. So that's been almost twenty four hours. Um, so you can you and that would still be perfectly good to use as actual miniature paint if I added probably a drop of medium to it would be like it was 24 hours ago. Um, so your paint just lasts a lot longer. I find it um, 
if we think back to the image that we had up at the start there, so like the um, the lawmaster on the sort of the flowing robes there. So that whole thing was done with three colours sitting on the palette and I just grabbed the ones I need and mix them together as I go. So that wasn't airbrushed or anything like that. Um, that was all um, blended together with the brush. So um, it just allows you to work with the paint a lot longer than you would if it was just sitting on like a tile or something like that. It's, it's going to dry up, um, but it, it basically keeps the paint workable for longer essentially um and as i said for me it was born out of necessity because the heating vent dries it out if i don't so um yeah that's that's sort of i guess where that came from originally but and before that i never used one but um once i started to i've never gone back so even sometimes when i'm traveling and stuff i'll i'll throw I'll, I'll, I, I know there's probably been some really confused hotel maids and stuff if i travel for work who'll find like the saucer <laughs> out of the out of the little kitchenette and I've like put paper towel in it and then laid baking paper over the top and they'll find like the saucer and just go, what on earth was this person doing in this room? Um, I was actually painting. So um, yeah, I, I always use one now. Do, does everyone here use a wet palette? Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah pretty much. I don't know. Okay, so so, so it's, it's definitely a tool to add in? Yep. Yeah. Definitely for all the reasons Travis was talking about. It just makes things so much easier. Cool. Yeah, and, um, it's so easy to put together too. And this is from YouTube that you guys saw it, like just putting it together or just like a particular blog, like people can just look up how to build a wet palette. Yeah, That's absolutely. Great. Sweet. Yeah, really doesn't take too much. I mean, my one is one of the Tupperware food containers you can buy from Woolies or Coles. It's one of the ones with little blue clips on it. And just like Travis, just, you know, any kind of old sponge discosh, well, a new one, not don't use an old one, um, <laughs> and just some baking paper on the top there. Yeah, it's all you need, you know, five bucks and you're ready to go. Yeah. Don't get um, the wax baking paper though. Just get the normal yeah, stuff. Yeah, no. Um, similarly, the old basing sand containers make a great mini one. Um, I tend not to work out of anything larger than this because I have a real issue with desk, um, desk clutter um, and anything larger and I can't fit enough random paint, spot on, uh, paint pots on my desk. Um, but you know, just literally your standard kitchen sponge you know, that you get in a you know five pack for two dollars um, fits perfectly into those, and you know comes the lid. It's perfect for traveling around with. Big so big tick on the wet palette. Um, Absolutely. What, are, what other tools? What other tools uh, do you guys use? So Nat, is there one that you'd recommend? Uh, yeah. So the the I've kind of got two. If I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, um, but the um, so first of all is brush soap because uh, it's something that most people probably won't think about um, in that you know you buy a brush you use it it goes out of condition you buy a new one um, so Liam, except... Liam's, got one, Liam's got one showing up Liam talk yep there we go, oh, there we go <laughs> exactly the same one um, yeah I've got, I've got that one as well love them I think it's the ma masters yeah masters um, you oh, can there's Travis it. as well. Show, there we show. Go. Oh, James, <laughs> everyone's mate, there. We've got a full house. Mine's in the lounge room. I swear I've got one. <laughs> um, but the best thing about it is that, you know, you can push your brushes a lot harder. And, you know, we've all been stuck in that situation where we've only got the one sort of raggedy brush and we're, we're trying our hardest to make it work, but it's just, it's not happening. Um, and you can really just make your brushes go for longer keep their points if you're trying to do anything that requires any bit of finesse it just makes everything so much easier um so you know it's they're not dear i think they're like eight dollars at eckersley's or riot arts and crafts any of those um and this thing will last you literally years just years and years and years it's important um, to keep your brushes clean like i can't stress it enough um, good yeah. for getting rid of it. Like uh, I find red pigment kind of stays around quite long in a, in a brush, and that's a really not. Especially when I'm doing red, I'll make sure to go through the dish, the soap and get rid of that red pigment, and then go back into, um, I guess, a refresh palette. Yeah, I think as well is when you're spending. Like I think all of us, if you're using GW brushes, have the Artificer ones, and they cost like thirty dollars and stuff. You don't want to keep going every two or three weeks when you're like constantly painting. To get a new one. So I'm like using having... Linser and Newtons. I just want to put it out there. I'm not using GW brushes, and I'm. But like this here has yeah. literally made all my Artificer brushes last forever, and I'm pretty sure even when I worked at GW, I had so many customers being like, "I keep coming in. I need more brushes," and I was like, "Look, 
grab this and you won't we'll see you like less getting brushes and more getting paints and then they're like yep done and then um it's been a dream but yeah it's been good yeah what is, what's the second tool yeah, now yeah what's the second one um so one of the things that i found really invaluable especially if you're getting into doing things where you're building up lots of layers over each other glazing anything like that um is a really good workable spray varnish um you know i know a lot of people have sort of hang-ups about varnishes because you know we've got the old uh, you know the old tales of our models turning white and frosty and all that sort of thing um but the one i use is just it's an artist's max matte fixative um, what it's meant to do is it's meant to attach things like um you know chalk pastels to paper um and i use that on my models because what it does is it seals everything in underneath um especially if i'm using some weird materials like you know pastels or you know watercolor pencils on models as i sometimes do um, and it'll seal everything in but it still provides that really lovely sort of workable surface over the top as if you've just primed the model um, and it means that if I happen to slip or anything like that, I can take a swab with a little bit of, you know, isopropyl or something and just get that top layer of paint off without, uh, you know, sobbing for the next hour over, you know, the day's worth of painting I've just lost. Love it. James, have you, you, you got two and then I'll um, ask Travis for one more. All right. Well, we already talked about something to hold your models with. So either the GW handles or some corks, they're really good. Um, for me, probably... Anthony, you did mention the Windsor & Newton brushes before, but for me, I, I use the Windsor & Newtons as well. But for me, um, for most people, you should probably buy bigger brushes than what you're currently using. Um, I use size 2 brushes for pretty much everything that I paint. Um, that includes tiny details, eyeballs, everything. Um, the Windsor & Newton specifically, since I use those, can speak to them, have really, really nice points on the end of the brush, and they have really nice long bristles as well. So you can get a lot of paint um, and water into these things. So that's sort of, I guess, my first one. Get yourself some bigger brushes. If you're using tiny ones, you're just going to have paint drying on your brush and can't get enough to do nice blends. Um, and the other one for me sort of seemed to have become popular in the last sort of six months to a year in the, in the hobby community um, is makeup brushes, um, specifically for dry brushing. So these things are really good. Uh, number one, they're cheap. I bought a packet of like 20 of these, something that looks like that for about five Travis, bucks. Travis tall, Travis. That's right. There you go. Yep. Yep, something like that. Um, yeah, the bristles are really nice and soft and they just make dry brushing stuff a breeze compared to any of the sort of hard ones that we've traditionally used in mini painting. So I guess they're sort of my two, two tools that I would recommend to people. Public service announcement, it's an announcement, uh, do not steal your partner's uh, makeup brushes. <laughs> that is a quick way to a divorce or a breakup. <laughs> yeah, um, from from a lady's perspective as well, uh, what you're looking for is the short bristled um, eyeshadow blending brushes. They tend to be a little bit more dense and have that lovely sort of short rounded surface. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and the nice thing about those packets, like the Travis held up, is you get like twenty a variety of so many different brushes in there, so yeah. you'll find one for every occasion. Travis, you got something? Give us, give us one more. Everyone's had two, and then I lost it, Liam. But uh, one more, the last one for me, um, and this is again something I never used to really. Um, well, it's just that's a bit of a lie. It's something I always concern myself with, but not for the reasons that I think you should concern yourself with it. Um, is and I, when I zoom the camera around before you would have seen it, but um, so I have a, a, a light sort of setup, and it is something to think about um, your your um, lighting setup wherever it is that you're painting. Um, I think we Liam mentioned it before, like in the stores and stuff, it's not necessarily set up for that. It's designed for retail. Um, you know, it's not um, it's not set up for for you know for painting miniatures. But um, particularly if you have um, like if you have old it seems to be older lights in houses, um, you can get very uh, it's this is gonna get slightly into color theory. I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but um, it, you can get more yellow, like warmer light. Um, Daytime balance. Um, yeah, I, I found that it the the overly yellow lights would make it harder for me to actually see what I was doing. Um, so at the time I went, well, I need a brighter light. So, and it wasn't really a brighter light. I, I ended up 
settling on. So I didn't really know why I settled on the light I did at the time. But what I, I settled on was a, 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 high, a, a daylight bulb, basically, for the, for the lamp I have, um, which is just a different tone, a different different colour light, essentially. Um, and for me, I, at the time, I did it because I had trouble seeing the models and I went, okay, yep, now I can see them, it's fine. But um, it is it, it will actually change your perception of colours and stuff like that as well. Um, but so a, a decent lighting setup, and it doesn't have to be super expensive. I know people a while back, there was people talking on Twitter about you know, these light setups you can get. And I looked at them, they're like $200 and stuff. It doesn't have to be that expensive, but have a think about the the space that you're actually going to be painting in and will it be, um, is it optimal for, for what you're trying to do, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make. I think Liam, you got, have you got one? Um, yeah, so similar to like what Travis said, but um, the ones to look for, and this is me coming from a photographer point of view, um, you need to get ones that are daylight balanced, which is like key. Don't go to tungsten or fluorescent. It's literally like you want daylight balanced LEDs. Um, also ones that are flexible, um, like pretty much like the one that I have on my desk right now, I can make sure like turn it and like twist it however I want. It's because like, I think we all know that we just like, constantly like changing angles of where we're looking at models and stuff. So having something that can like move with you is like key. Um, and also the reason why LEDs and you guys all have wet palettes and stuff, but if you want to keep your paints to dry longer, like not dry as fast, um, these aren't putting any heat out. So yeah, that's pretty much the main thing for me, especially if you don't have a wet palette, like this is super like handy. Um, and Kmart and everything sells them for like $5. Um, but generally, I pretty much use everything that everyone's been mentioned, really. Um, I don't know if you guys have the GW new water pot. Does anyone else have that? Or is that just me? I, I do. Um, yeah, so that's one that I rate quite highly because it's designed to clean the bristles and also has like a little thing on the side to get the point back. Um, that's what I've been using compared to I've, the um, old I've, three, I've 3D printed this little ring that goes around it uh, that actually holds your brushes as well. So you can, I can have like a little brush stand that kind Planned. of wraps around. So, But yeah, that's a couple of things. Um, and yeah, for me, like when it comes to space and stuff and painting, I have to make sure the lighting's right. And that's kind of why I've stopped going to the store because having this at home um, has been super important, especially if I want to like show people on Twitter and stuff what I've been working on. This light is way better than what you see in a GW store because I think when I worked in a GW store, I constantly always like had to like be behind, like down under the light and painting and like having like really bad posture. So, yeah, that's it really. Um, quick, quick uh, call out, Joel Graham and I know Travis has acknowledged this in the chat, but it's a good question. Uh, Joel's asked about uh, where they can buy uh, a lamp, uh, a, a good desk lamp, and obviously we've talked about these daylight bulbs. Uh, you can buy buy any lamp. Like you can go to Kmart, uh, Bunnings. I think I bought one from Mita Ten. It's just whatever whatever lamp suits your needs. Um, go on eBay, and then you pick up a daylight bulb. Um, obviously, the, the head that kind of matches, but uh, that uh, will make a significant difference to your to your painting and just gives you a uh, a clearer view of what you're painting. Well. There's some lights that you can get now that are like clamp onto the desk. So if you don't want to have confined space, get it clamped on so it's not in your way. But and yeah, like the one I away. yeah, the one I have is a clamp, and my speed up because I used to use this one, which like takes up so much real estate. Um, and having this clamp here now, I have more space to like one my drinking, and my mic and a few other things. So. Yeah, that's another thing as well. Um, you don't want I know, it to be too cluttered. Uh, I know a couple of people, uh, myself included, sort of have started jumping on the light arch bandwagon as well. Um, and so the advantage of having a light arch means that you have that sort of almost sort of surround sound effect with um, your lighting. Um, so you've got you know, light coming in from all angles. It makes it easier to see exactly what you're doing, you know, regardless of where you're holding the model. Um, there are a couple of good places you can get those. I know there's a um, an Aussie company that does sort of fit, you know, put together your own MDF ones. Um, yeah, I and them at Can they were at CanCon. Yeah, um, mm. Battlefield Accessories. Um, and so they're pretty good. I've got 
their one and it's done me really well. And the best thing about it is when I go out to, um, I was at the Central Coast Comic Con lately um, and I had the stall there and all I had to do was bring two um, phone battery packs with me, plug them straight into the USBs and I was running it all day just off a battery pack. Um, so if you're sort of short on USB slots or, you know, PowerPoints near your workspace, that's also another nice option. Yeah, I can also second the light arch. As you can see here, I use one as well. Um, mine's a little bit more kit bash though, um, the homemade version. So I went out to Bunnings, I think it was, and bought myself like an LED light strip, like a flexible one. Um, and I think this is a piece of... I don't know, something that goes around a curtain, maybe. I don't know, it's some piece of metal at Bunnings. Um, so I bought it and just bent it into this arch shape and I've literally screwed it down onto my desk. Um, so this will only really work if you can if you can keep it here. This doesn't really move anywhere. But yeah, getting that sort of surround sound effect for your lighting is um, really useful. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so the next question is, so we've talked about like different paints and stuff we've used kind of throughout the show and everything, but do you guys swear by like just using GW paints or do you guys use stuff like scale 75 or any other brands that you guys would like put in your kit? Um, like which so ones do you use mostly? I use pretty much any paints I can get my hands on. Um, I do have a few GW paints, but most of my collection is probably Vallejo, both the game color and the model color ranges. Um, if anyone has only been using GW paints up until this point, the Vallejos are probably the most similar other kind of paint I've found. They they work and behave pretty much the same way as Citadel paints do. Um, I also have some Scale 75, some Army painters. Um, I haven't got to try any of the war color paints yet. For anyone that's heard of those, I would like to try some though. Um, but primarily Vallejo for me, but whatever I can get my hands on. Yeah. Don't stick to one Sweet. brand. Sweet. Nah. Uh, yeah, I'll use a, a massive mix of them. Um, so the Citadel stuff is probably still my bread and butter um, because they're just what I'm comfortable with. Um, and, you know, as you expand out into um, paints and different brands and things like that, you know, anyone who hasn't yet will find that you'll get favorites from each one. And you sort of start to pick and mix your own collection. Um, but another thing I also do is, you know, going back into sort of my dipping into artists' equipment and stuff like that. Um, I spent way too long working in sort of various art stores. Is I've still got, you know, random models of, um, you know, artists' grade acrylic paint. Um, this one's the high flow random acrylic that I had um, that I did the blood effect on the little diorama I was working on. Um, and yeah, it's all about sort of finding what you want out of a paint and kind of steering into brands that match your fit. Okay. Sweet. And then Travis? Yeah, for me, it's, um, uh, it's, it, it, a lot of the time it depends on the color. So I have um, a reasonably extensive collection of the GW paints. Um, I have uh, a, a growing collection of scale 75 paints, um, which... Uh, it, it, but the the most of the colors, so some of the colors I have, I, I bought specifically because of what they are. So, um, for example, I, I have a P3 white and a um, uh, um, brand now that's completely escaped me, but um, I have a black specifically because I was never really happy with how the, um, the bad and black, what is it called? The bad and black? Uh, yeah, Abaddon black. black. Yeah, um, it, uh, how it behaved, the GW paint behaved. I just, I was never really super happy with how it came out. So I targeted specific colors that I wanted um, for that reason. Um, there's a few more weird and wonderful ones I have as well. I have some of the Vallejo stuff um, model here and um, model and game color stuff. Um, but I also have some some other weird and wonderful ones which I've occasionally played around with. Um, so there's a range called Mecha Color, uh, which is yeah. a sort of really. Uh, uh, that's the way to describe it, sort of like fluoro colours, I guess, to some extent. Um, yep. but, and they're quite tricky and hard to get used to. But um, So it, it for me, it's more of a, a, a mixture of stuff depending on what I'm trying to do or what particular colour I'm trying to paint. Um, so while we're talking about paints and stuff, I do know, Nat, you have used these paints, but do you guys experiment with the colour shift stuff? 
at all? Uh, I haven't ever used them before, so I can't really comment on them. Okay, so Matt, I know you yeah. are. So you live. I remember there was like a couple of projects where you like live by them for a while. Um, um, do you? Would you ever say? Would you put them in your kit? Like, would say like add them in for a bit of fun. They're there for a bit of fun, but I haven't found a sort of an extended use for them. Um, okay. It is one of those things where they do like an interesting effect really well, but unless you're already sort of unless you're just starting an army and you want to get that consistency and go through you know, and use it as a core part of your color scheme. They're kind of, they're sort of one trick ponies as far as okay. I'm concerned. Uh, they do one thing okay. and it's really cool, but not sure how useful it is. I, so I kind of settled. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to put some context that um, for the people who don't know what we're talking about here, uh, Green Stuff World, I think it is, uh, has yes. put out this series of paints, which are, uh, I, I guess mimics very much like, let's say, like a fish where, you know, that that colour kind of shines through and there's a whole, almost like a rainbow effect uh, with multiple essentially shifting colours. Um, yeah. That, sorry, I just, I just want to put that context around, like, what is he shifting? Yeah. Well, I've I, never heard of it. I was yeah. going to add it in, but, yeah, that's pretty much what it is. Um, you see it in a lot of car paint. It's probably the best way to describe it. Like, in cars, like show cars have it a lot. Um, and I think it only recently just got into model painting. I think it was like two years ago. Yeah, um, right. I think they're also called chameleon paint sometimes. Yeah. Um, but basically, what they are is they're one base color, um, generally sort of a light metallic, um, and then they've got an iridescent pigment that um, that only becomes apparent when the light hits it at a certain angle. Um, yeah. I sort of. I've seen it used really well on Deepkin. Matt, you've seen it. Yeah, um, I used it on some of the water effect for my Deepkin. Just to get sort of a sort of almost icy effect on the water, um, but to get reliable results, I ended up sort of having a look at how they worked and just kind of starting to paint the colors in themselves. Uh, so they're really cool to play around with, but I don't think I've found a permanent place for them. Fair enough. I can see Seraphim in, in the chats mentioned that he's used it on a Lariel's beetle. I've seen it used on Deepkin as well. Trav, are you going to say something? Yeah. So I've. I do have a set of them, um, which I've played around with, but I found they also, the other thing is they work um, a lot better on larger surfaces rather than yeah. small detail. Um, so I also painted Alariel's Beetle with um, the pink and purple one, whichever one's called. Um, but I, I found on the smaller parts of the Beetle, it wasn't as noticeable. Um, and I've seen similar, similar commentary and stuff floating around. So I think it's something that, that has a use, but I don't know if I'd ever paint a whole arm or anything like that you, you wouldn't say for someone who wants to improve in their painting it's a must have to add into the kit no no, no sweet is it it's a very niche thing um so what are the, some more advanced tools that you guys would recommend owning like is there like so we're talking about like the brush cleaner and everything but is there anything that's like advanced that you would like recommend to add in or own or start using I'll, th I'll throw the first one in and I'd love uh, their feedback on is things like airbrushes. Um, so a lot of a lot of questions came up uh, in chats in the past uh, and even in the chat today around, um, you know, should I get an airbrush? When should I use an airbrush? Um, you know, is an airbrush better, worse than a, than a, like a, a regular brush? I guess that uh, I'd love to hear the thoughts around the airbrush before we go into other other tools. I don't think it's better or worse. Um, it certainly has some advantages. So, for example, um, you know, I'm painting up some Stormcast at the moment. Um, it was sure a hell of a lot quicker to paint um, the, you know, the base colour on 10 guys just by running it through the brush and being done in five minutes than it would have been to sit there doing it in one or two coats of the brush. Um, but I, I don't know if it's, um, you know, uh, the be all to end all and it's just like any other painting technique it definitely takes practice um you can't just buy one and chuck some paint in it and hope for the best um i i own mine for a good year before i was confident in actually um doing anything more than just applying a solid base color to a model um it, it it's definitely something you can use but i don't think it's um you know the be all to end all um 
the, the, to decide whether or not it's I actually just glanced down and I so in the chat someone said it's a tool with a purpose and I 100% agree so um, and you certainly can paint a whole model with it like James showed at the start you know you can paint um, the fast riders guys with mostly with the airbrush but um, he's a lot better at it than me but um but you know you can definitely um, um, you can use it and you can do that if you want but you can also it, it is a big a time saver as well I think if you use it even just basically um, but I don't think you must have one to to produce an amazing looking army by any stretch of the imagination mm. yeah uh, well my thoughts on the airbrush are it, yes I do think people should get one uh, as Travis mentioned it is a massive time saver if nothing else um, I know we've all only got limited amounts of time in our lives to spend hobbying um, and for me it just saves saves so much time um, as Travis mentioned, it will take some getting used to. Um, I often hear comments from people, um, you know, that have been painting for a while, just using a brush, and then they go and get themselves an airbrush, and they use it a little bit and say, oh, I couldn't really get the hang of it, or I, you know, didn't know how to use it. Um, and, and so I've just, you know, left it and gone back to painting with the brush. Well, it's a completely different technique, something you're not used to. So, of course, your painting's not going to be good straight away with the airbrush. You do need to give yourself some time to practice, to play with it, um, again, like Travis mentioned, I think I had mine for about a month just putting undercoat on models before I did anything else with it. Um, but, you know, you, you build up that confidence over time. You, you practice with it just like any other technique that you do painting your models. Um, and, and once you, you know, I've had enough time to practice and you get to a certain point, you know, you know, it's paying dividends in spades. Like I couldn't tell you the amount of time my airbrush has saved me over the last couple of years painting models it just makes blending smoother makes undercoating easier allows me to varnish models more often um yeah i think it's an amazing tool and and people should really look at getting one if they don't have one and, and putting some time into practicing with it i know i know nathan p from sydney uh was talking to me about um wanting to wanting to hear from you around how do you av avoid overspraying and and knowing when it's appropriate to try the airbrush uh i guess broad mm -hmm. question to everybody is um, do you have any advice around things like overspraying and when it's appropriate or when's a good time to use an airbrush versus, because uh, I think everyone kind of knows the base coating piece is a nice one, but what are, what are some of the other ways to use an airbrush? Um, yeah, so I have some really advanced tools when it comes to not getting overspray on models. Um, old business cards are really great. You literally just say, hold it underneath the model um, as you're doing the airbrushing and while you haven't got overspray on the rest of it. Uh, if I need something with a bit more detail, um, Warhammer Weekly talks about this quite a bit. I use Silly Putty. Um, you know, it's kind of like a blue tacky type thing. You just stick that on the model, do your airbrushing, and then pull it straight back off. Um, nice and simple when it comes to masking. Um, as far as when to use it, again, it comes down to, to practice if you want to go past just doing the base coats um, for models. Um, you generally need to get in nice and close to the model um, and make sure you're not sticking too much air um, and paint through it at the one time. So again, that's just practice. Work on a piece of paper, work on an old model you don't really care about, you know, and just try and paint smaller details um, on the model. Paint a shoulder pad, for example, um, trying not to get paint on other parts of the mini, um, I guess is the best recommendations I can give. Again, it's, it's practice. Most things come down to practice. You just need to try it, do it. Get feedback. Try again. Nat, Trav, any any other pieces of, of airbrush advice? Um, the the first the first airbrush that I bought was um, was a, a quite a cheap one um, that, that I just picked up just to go. Hey, I've got one. Let's see what I can do with it. Um, and one initially when I got it, I sort of went, Oh no, this is, doesn't really work. Uh, but uh, decided to give it another shot and did a little bit of research into it. Um, I had literally bought. I think the cheapest airbrush I could find, um, and there are limitations to the, the tool. Um, so the the one I, I have two of them now. Um, I don't have that one anymore, but I have two of them now. Um, one I guess I would consider more of a base coating airbrush, and then I have one that um, I use most often. That um, that that is more that I'm still get, still very much getting used to, but um, that I'm starting to get more confident with. Um, and one of the things that I did when I got it was I practiced, I, I just had blank sheets of paper um, and I would sit there basically trying to do the smallest dot that I could without um, 
and know where that dot was going to land. So there was no long since throwing them out, but I had just sheets of paper with a hundred dots on it and trying to get the smallest dot in exactly the place I wanted the dot to be. Um, and you won't necessarily be able to do that with every, with every brush. Um, the, there are certainly some that are just not going to be capable of it. There, there are detail levels and stuff that you, you need to work around. Um, but that, that was, that was one of my first exercises when I when after I initially thought this doesn't work and went back to it was actually just trying to learn to control the thing. And it is, it is a skill just like every other painting technique to, um, to actually get the hang of it. Um, yeah. Sweet. Yeah, agreed. Um, it's just like picking up a brush for the first time. It's going to be something that you're going to have to spend time going through and basically learning how an entirely new concept works. Um, they're really, really handy. Like I get enough use out of mine that, you know, it's constantly set up. Uh, but you are going to have to go through sort of a really rocky period um, before you actually get, you know, that, that that moment where the thing turns out as it's meant to look in your head, if that makes any sense. Um, sort of contrary, I'm actually using like one of the cheapest airbrushes I could find because I had a horror moment where I lost mine when we moved um, and of course only found it again the moment that the other one arrived. Uh, but I mean, it's working really well for me. Um, my suggestion is that especially when some of the components um, can be very um, very small and easy to break and bend needles and things like that. It's it's not a bad idea, as far as I'm concerned, to pick up a you know a, a medium to cheap one. So don't go bottom of the barrel, uh, but something to mess around with before you invest in like a three hundred dollar airbrush. Um, get used to it. Find out how the dual sort of ad, the dual action system works and things like that. That's great. And and I guess Liam's a re uh, question before I hijacked it was. Um, is there any other like more advanced tools that like once you've kind of got you know your lamp, you've got your brushes, you've got all that basic foundational stuff? Is there uh, any other things that you've got in your kitty um, that might be valuable? That silence makes it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm just kind of trying to think. Uh, something that I've found useful recently. Um, is this stuff here. This is Dalarani FW ink, uh, specifically the white ink I really like. Um, now, I talked about not using white on models before, um, but with all good rules, there are times <laughs> to break them. that's a lie. <laughs> there are times to break them. Um, so this is what I used for the weapons on my corn models, um, for people that have seen those. Um, this is just a really nice, intense white ink um, that doesn't break up in the same way um, that some other whites can tend to. So it can allow you to get some nice blends um, when you're trying to push up to those really sharp points on the weapons. So I'd recommend this specifically. I do have some of the other Dalarani inks as well. They're quite nice inks, but the white is, at least for me, fairly unique. So that was been a pretty nice one to pick up. I had no idea there was white ink. I've got I've got a big pot of black ink, but no, yep. there's brown ink. Never knew there was a white ink. Yep, there is yeah. white ink out there. Oh, mind blown. Yeah. Um. um Go oh, it's um, they're not particularly sort of high tech, but uh, when it comes down to freehand, which I know a lot of people find quite daunting to get into, and start to sort of learn how to do that. Um, one of the things I've picked up using in the last couple of months is quite literally your standard, like that Faber Castell watercolor pencils. Um, so what I end up doing is I chuck a like a sealant down on the model first. So obviously, I'm not going to scratch up any paint. Um, not that these will normally, uh, but just, you know, that extra bit of protection. Um, but what it allows me to do is start to sketch out some designs on the models, get placement, things like that in really quickly and easily without that threat of if I, you know, if I sneeze or twitch or, you know, just, you know, move the model in the wrong way, I'm just going to make, you know, a massive streak across this surface that I'm going to have to cover up. Um, and, you know, off, you know, off the Sigma topic, but, so something like, there you go. So something like that is um, one of the pieces I've got in progress, and most of that was sketched out in about an hour and fleshed out using watercolor pencils to get that thing down. And the best part about them is you can, um, if you need to erase details, just put some water over the top of it, 
you know, works as good as an eraser. Mind blown. <laughs> I've never even thought about it. I haven't really experimented with freehand, so that's a whole new thing to me. Uh, yeah, what, it's something just... that I... That, sorry, dude. Go, uh, go. It's something that I picked up from, you, you know, how you go through sort of weird YouTube searches and you come across sort of other creative things that link in. Um, it's something that a lot of, um, like, doll repainters will use. So they'll, you know, effectively, similar to working on large-scale busts and things like that, um, they'll use um, watercolour pencils and chalk pastels to apply sort of soft gradients of colour and, you know, build it up similar to glazing in lots of layers they lacquer over and then sort of just keep on building up that colour. Um, so something I sort of appropriated from that and it's been working really well so far. Sweet. Travis, you were going to say something before? No, the only other one that I I have somewhere around here, I just don't know about yet, um, and this is this is again something that I started doing to just because I decided I need to. But um, I have a even even with the paint handle. So even though I have like a paint handle and I rarely actually hold on to the model, um, a lot of the time I'll actually wear um, just a food prep glove, like a latex glove, on one hand. Um, the reason I do this is I find that I have very oily skin on my hands. Um, and if I touch the model, I will, I will put a very obvious like fingerprint on the model. Um, so that's, it might be something that you notice, you know, if you, particularly on edges and stuff like that. Like if you put, if you hold the edge of a model, and certainly something I found, if I if I held the edge of a model and then tried to apply paint to that layer, there's actually a layer of oil over it and it doesn't work. Um, so I actually found find a lot of the time I'll be painting with a glove on one hand in yeah. some new Michael Jackson style. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's uh, there's a box of them around here somewhere um, that I'll slowly burn my way through. Sweet. I didn't even think about gloves. I see for like airbrushing, like heaps of people using for airbrushing stuff, so you can like also like spray it on their hand stuff. But um, I had like this one really bad habit where I used to like, you know, how, like you would like clean get excess stuff on your palette. For me, I would do it on my hand. And like I says, I knew, I think some of you guys may have done it, but like, yeah, that would be cool just to not have as painty hands. But yeah, I think that's it for like tools and everything because we were already chatting about contrast paint. Um, so we'll talk about like building the skills and the knowledge. Um, so before you guys start off a project, how do you guys choose colors for that project? Like using the color wheel or anything like that or color theory? I might actually bring up the color wheel now, which might make, uh, which might help a little bit. Um, so this this was a concept that was kind of introduced to me last CanCon, or at least reminded uh, something that I hadn't looked at since art class. Um, I think it's now sharing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's all sorted. So we've got the color wheel there, and then we also have one showing hues and saturation and stuff. So when you guys choosing your color scheme, do you refer to this before you start? Uh, so I will. Um, there's a really nice website out there um, called Color Scheme Designer 3. Um, it's essentially a color wheel that you can then move the dials around and you can pick whether you want to use two colors or four colors or three colors. Um, and it will sort of show you um, where your complementary colors are or where, where your triads are. So essentially, it's trying to help you pick the colors that work well together. Um, and you can play with a whole bunch of different things, but it's really nice just to sort of see them all together. Um, as far as, so I do use that. And then again, just finding inspiration out there, seeing what other people have done on models, finding out works, what looks good to me on other models um, and sort of taking it from there. I'll tend to try and stay away from some sort of box art schemes as much as I can and do something a little bit different. Um, but yeah, that that's a really handy tool. So that's something I'd recommend people check out. I just had a quick look up and it is pretty cool. Um, yep. I do know that Adobe has released something like this called um, Color. Some, like You look up Color Wheel Adobe and it just pops up first. And I use that heaps before I start picking colors and stuff. But yeah, that's really cool. I had no way. I like this one way better. So um, what's it called yeah. again? So everyone can like follow through. What's it called uh, again? It's called Color Scheme Designer 3. So if you type that into Google, it should be the first thing that pops up. And, Amer and the spelling is American color, not Australian color. So there's no U. Yeah. I just typed it in. It's amazing. It is awesome. 
So, so you follow the uh, color wheel quite heavily there, James? Yeah, so I'll definitely use that to try and help uh, inform my decisions when picking a new army. Um, the, the picture over on the right um, is sort of, I, I put that one up there because I think this is something that not a lot of people think about all the time when they're doing their painting. And this is something um, I really picked up on a lot more recently from a good friend, Trent of mine, um, who's another excellent painter here in Brisbane. Um, so most people know about, so hue, um, as you sort of go around that pie there. So that's the actual color that you're painting with. Um, but then you've also got the value. So that's sort of how much of the color you've got sort of going up and down the pie and then saturation um, going from, from the center to the outside. So it's important to know that when you're actually painting your colors on your model, um, for example, a lot of people use say like mix in white with their color to, to highlight the color. And what you're actually doing when you do that is you're not only increasing the value of your color, so essentially moving from the bottom up in that pie, but you're also moving inwards as well when you're adding more white. So it's sort of going to the middle and up. So you're actually desaturating the color. You know, same thing when you add black to a color, you're, you're desaturating it and pushing it down into the corner. Um, so if you want to get sort of brighter colors, um, you can certainly add in white. Um, or bright colors to do your highlights. But then if you take your original color um, and then do light glazes over the top, um, you'll you'll build that that um, saturation of your actual original color back up much further um, and generally give yourself a much nicer effect as well. So that's just sort yeah. of there to hopefully demonstrate that idea. Okay, sweet. Um, Nat, do you follow through something similar or? Yeah. Um, so usually I'll have sort of a, a key color in mind for something I want to do. So, you know, thinking about if I want to have sort of a strong orange tone or something like that. Um, and then I'll, you know, I don't, so I don't tend to refer to a website or anything like that, but I'll pick colors um, that will work with that one color and build my color scheme from there, sort of working up from that. Um, yeah. The pie on the right, as we were just talking about, absolutely fantastic to reference to. Um, if you have to reference a color wheel, something like that is going to be way more valuable um, than just the flat one in terms of actually sort of leveling up your painting per se. Um, mainly because we were talking before about different levels of contrast and hue, saturation, value, are all different avenues of contrast that you can pursue in very different ways. Yeah. Um, the other thing is it'll help you identify colors if you want to match them. Um, so for example, um, so I'll be doing a little sort of class soon. And part of that is going to be how to sort of use those three different measures of color um, to identify what one color is and figure out how to um, recreate it um, when you're actually trying to paint it as well. Yeah. Um, so it's a really, really valuable tool to have. Um, and just even if you have it tucked in the back of your head, the more you refer to it, the more it's going to become second nature. Gotcha. I, I would recommend everybody uh, spend some time on the color wheel. Um, there's there's so I mean, I mean, you know, most people probably pick colors that are cool or they like or they think it's going to be good. But there's so much. I remember going through a, a workshop. It was a one day workshop with um, some amazing painters down in Canberra and just reminding me about, you know, not, not only the primary and the secondary colors, but thinking about colors, you know, cool versus warm colors, thinking about, you know, colors that oppose the, the color that might be great for, for contrast or make something stand out. Uh, then, you know, as James and, and Natalie have talked about it, then thinking about the saturation of that color and maybe mixing a little bit of white, a little bit of black to bring out X or Y. So um, there's a whole science behind this, which is why I, uh, I was really excited to share this slide and, and and get people thinking that if you haven't looked into the color wheel or it's something you haven't seen since art, um, definitely spend some time. There's some great videos, great websites, and that uh, James, the one that you just recommended, uh, color uh, color scheme designer, fantastic tool as well to help build this skill. And you hopefully probably would use this less and less. Hmm. Another little um. I guess, I guess this interesting tidbit, um, since the color wheel is up here that I learned fairly recently, um, a lot of people will talk about how like all, all the colors are, are sort of um, next to each other here. If you 
say if you want to go from green to blue, for example, you can't like blend those two colors together without getting green in between them because you can see the greens in between them in the color wheel. Um, but you can actually go around the color wheel the other way if you want to. So from yellow, you can actually go around orange, red, purple, and then get to blue. And you can actually have those colors have a, um, a yellow to blue gradient, for example, without having green popping up in the middle, which I just thought was really fascinating when I found that out. So something interesting to keep in mind, that you can go around the wheel both ways. That, that's that's bizarre. Um, what? what would, <laughs> that's super bizarre. I'd love Sorry. to see an example of that. Can you please do a testing of that? What? You broke me. Okay. If, yeah, we have. If you, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, if you look at um, Kaha's miniature painting, which is definitely really crazy and out there, it was actually her class that I learned this at. And if you look at some of the models she paints, you can see that she can do these really weird gradients so, sort of through all these odd colors in different directions. So, they, okay, yeah, cool. Right. All right. <laughs> I, need check, I need to check this out. We can keep if going, want, but my mind if is. If you'd like alive. to learn more, James has yeah. a Twitter account. <laughs> yeah. to find James's Twitter because my mind is actually blown. Like what? Yeah, I was pretty amazed when I um when I saw that and heard that in action. I feel fun. like I've been lied to at my photography school. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting it that way and putting it into sort of that really sort of easy to understand statement, it it makes a big difference. Yeah, I, um, I'm such a visual person, so you saying it is like not helping. I'm like, what? But yeah, I'll have to check it out. <laughs> I think you um, guys are kind of nicely moving into this bracket. And, um, you know, James, you've mentioned that, you know, you've gone on and done classes um, with other painters. And I'm sure, Travis, I'm sure, Natalie, um, you guys have all um, uh, learnt from other people, you know, the YouTube videos, you know, you've practised. Um, I guess I guess for me is, like, how do you build this skill? And maybe I'll start it off with, like, how much time should somebody invest into painting to kind of, uh, build that skill, and then I guess any anything else you guys have around um, around that might kind of resonate with this particular slide, which is about your ability and time, and you know really that um, that that uh, that journey that people will take uh, in building that skill. Well, I know we've already established that pretty much all of us here will paint at least, or paint or hobby, or do something towards you know that end per day. Um, you know, I know that. You know, I, I'll easily spend a couple of hours at least each day, um, you know, sitting down, painting, um, getting something done. Um, and obviously it does depend on your time load. You know, someone who's working nine to five obviously won't have as much time as, say, a student who can sort of really um, hunker down and learn something in between assignments and when they've got time off and things like that. Skip um, your lectures. What was that, sorry? Skip your lectures. Yeah, yeah you know, attendance is a thing. I've seen those pictures. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, if you can set aside a, you know, at least, you know, a couple of hours, say twice a week, um, it's enough to start forming a habit and start getting that as sort of learning time. Um, if anyone else wants to... Uh, chime in. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to speak on behalf of all three of us. So, um, no. Uh, one, one. Look, um, one of the things I see occasionally, um, which I don't necessarily think it's actually true, and again, some people are probably going to try and at me on Twitter here, but now, um, <laughs> a lot of people. Uh, sometimes you'll see comments like, "Oh, like you know, that's impossible. I couldn't do that." Um, you know, it's it's um, you know, they're definitely just like anything else. Um, Take a step. Actually, just take a step away from painting for a moment. Um, say, if you want to learn how to play football, and you can interpret that word however you want, depending where you're listening around the world, whether that means the round one or the one where you throw it, or the one where you spend forty-five minutes playing three minutes of the game in the US. But, um, um, but so if, if you want to learn how to play football, you, you, you there's of course there's going to be some element of you know some people might be genetically gifted to have that better muscle tone or whatever but um for the most part if you put the hours in and if you you know exercise and train and and build up your stamina and strength and whatnot you're going to get better at playing football um but the same sort of basic principle applies so uh, and, and as i said i don't necessarily believe it's true when when people say oh i couldn't possibly do that or uh you know it, i wish you i had i had your talent or something like that 
there may be a small aspect of that, but I think a larger majority of it is being willing to put in the time and an effort to sort of practice at something. And this is, I guess, what this slides, uh, this pitch is about. Um, if you're if you're willing to put the put the hours into working at something, you you will see an improvement in what you're producing at the other end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And to to continue on um, from Travis's football analogy, because this is clearly a sports podcast, um, when you're trying to get better at football, people don't just go and play a bunch of football games. Well, they can, um, and you might get some overall improvement, but they'll go and train and they'll practice dribbling the ball, they'll practice passing the ball, they'll practice all just these little elements that form up the entire game that is football. And so similar to what I was saying at the start about deliberate practice. If you want to get better at uh, painting, you should try and get more specific about what it is that you want to get better at. So I want to try and practice some non-metallic metals on this model, or I want to try and practice my two brush blending on this model, whatever it might be, and get more specific about what you're trying to do and actually practice that. Um, and you know, figure out how you're actually dividing up your hobby time when it comes to that practice. If all of your hobby time is currently going into the mad dash to get your army ready for the next tournament, well, then you're not necessarily giving yourself that ability to practice new techniques that practice at actually improving at stuff. You might get faster at painting, trying to paint lots of things really quickly, um, but trying to build your skills, you know, you have to specifically try and target them um, to practice them. And then, like I said before, get feedback on those take them to other people and say hey i really tried you know my non-metallic metals on this model what do you think you know could you give me any feedback what's your advice how can i do better um and hopefully you find someone that can give you good feedback you know will tell you honestly you know what looks good what you can improve on and you can take that feedback on board and go and go and try again on the next model and hopefully it's a bit better um and sort of go through that loop as much as you can and can i just add to to that that good feedback at least in my my perception here and i'm putting my business lens on is that good feedback isn't positive feedback good feedback yeah. is constructive feedback and it's something that's tangible that you can walk away with and um if i think of you know again in a working analogy there's things there's, there's techniques called the positive sandwich which is like something that's really good a constructive opportunity to grow it's not a negative it's like well you know, if you'd like to improve this model, something you may want to consider is X. Have you considered Y? And taking that on board, I think uh, being open to feedback um, is a huge asset, not only in hobby, but in life. Um, and, and seeking the feedback out, asking people and being open and willing to uh, to hear people's critiques. And, and obviously, you know, not everyone's not right all the time, but hearing some of the commonality and the ideas and that's how you're going to grow that skill. Is that a fair assumption, team? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Like, like I can say right now with my work, I know you were talking about your work and stuff, but like for me, like I'm trying to get better at my own job, the job that I do every day. Um, and I still always like seeking to do better, which I'm sure we all are with our painting, for example. And like literally, as you said, like um, constructive feedback is the best feedback and I literally like um, Anthony I remember I probably sent you a photo of some work that I did just recently um, and to me that was an awesome shot but like if I sent it to someone else who I would look up to as like let's say a painter or photographer like I look there's this photographer that I look up to and he's giving me constructive feedback he goes hey look cool shot but etc 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 and like you look at the shot and again you go like, oh mind blown and now I'm going to go back and like fix a shot in a way or go back the next one I do it do it better but yeah like all that kind of feedback is super good so like if there's a way that people can get feedback like and get constructive feedback is probably the best way to get better really yeah um absolutely and, and um i feel like twitter and instagram is probably the best places to go or facebook is the best places to go um for that if you guys all agree like getting some feedback from the community so yeah. they're really good um, I find that it's it's pretty hard, at least for me, to give feedback seeing photos. Um, I much prefer to have the model there in my hands um, and actually, you know, look at it from all angles um, if I want to give people feedback myself. Um, I'm always happy to do that, by the way. Um, if anyone ever sees me at events, you have free pass to come up to me and say hi if you want, and I can give you any feedback on any models um, you would like or just come up for a hobby chat. I'm always open to that. Um, and another good way to get feedback is to actually enter painting competitions. 
I know that can be really daunting for a lot of people if they've never done it before. Um, but, you know, taking that step, putting whatever model it is you've got in a competition and then actually afterwards seeking the feedback from the people judging that competition because they will be able to give you that good constructive feedback of, you know, what was good, but, you know, where you could do with some improvement in different areas in your model and just being able to get your model there, get all that good feedback and also seeing it just up against some of the other models that people have painted. You can They can compare them to you say, okay, yours was, you know, like this. This was, say, one of the ones that won or did better. You know, they can show you and compare the differences between the two. So that's been really valuable feedback for me to help grow as a painter. Sorry, and, and a question from the chat, which I think is relevant at this particular point is, um, uh, Matt, Matt Hibble has asked around uh, what undercoats we're using. And I think it's kind of a, this might be a nice little uh, discussion around um, when you're priming a model, you know, when's a good time to use white versus gray versus black, or maybe even um, one of the colored ones, maybe just like a quick, um, like, how do you look at uh, the priming undercoat that first color stage? Maybe Travis, maybe I'll throw it to you first. Yeah, I actually just type in the chat the answers. Um, so for me, um, I'll use just the black by GW or um, through the airbrush, the black or gray, I think it's called Gris something or other. Um, it's basically a gray uh, surface primer by Vallejo, um, which is essentially the same thing, I guess. But um, personally, I never use white. Um, even, even if I'm painting a very lightly colored model, I'll find I just don't use it. Um, and I think that's more of a sort of a personal choice and painting style than anything else. But um, I, I tend not to um, not to use white when I'm undercoating stuff. So yeah. anyone's got a similar or uh, different view? Um, depending uh, on the model that I'm painting. Um, uh, sorry. It, so depending on what I'm doing, if I want to go for a really bright model, I'll generally go with a lighter prime. Um, regardless of what I'm doing, I'll generally do a zenithal prime. Um, so basically getting your dark color on the model and then priming from the top down. Um, because even if I'm not sort of, even if I'm completely covering it up and doing something else, um, it still helps me sort of see where all the details are on the model, get a feel for, you know, what stands out really well. Um, but so a lot of the time, especially with lighter skin tones and things like that, I'll actually glaze in color over the top using washes and things. Um, so having a really light prime really helps me there because I don't have to worry about, um, especially since lighter colors can be so thick when we paint with them, um, you know, clogging up detail with, say, putting another white base coat on or anything like that. Um, so as a rule of thumb, if it's metallics or um, darker colors, I'll go with the black. Um, but if I want brighter colors or if I'm working with a really light model, um, it'll be sort of a gray with a white over the top. Yeah, and sim similar to that, I'll pretty much zenithal prime all of my models. It's only very rare occasions where I don't. So black all over and then gray from the top. And then sometimes, depending on the model, I'll use a lighter gray. It's not white, um, but sort of just around the the face, head, and shoulder regions to help sort of push that part of the model forward a bit more because that's where you want to draw most of the attention in, in most models anyway, sort of towards the face region. So paint that brighter with the undercoat is a really good place to start to just help really, as we were talking about contrast before, pop the contrast of that area out compared to the rest of the model. I'm going to ask uh, two questions from, um, from the community. And then I think we've got two final questions that I know Liam wants to ask. So, uh, so maybe some rapid fire, ones, rapid fire ones from the community. Luke Ingram was asking around some advice around non-metallic metals. Um, a few people had co commented after the back of that. And basically the, the general feel was they kind of watched tutorials and they weren't really happy with the results. Um, any advice, any thoughts around uh, non-metallic metals, uh, obviously to the group? Uh, so practice it more um and get feedback they're they're really my two main points like i mentioned the videos by painting buddha before the the one that travis mentioned too those are excellent videos uh for learning how to do non-metallic metals in a, in a fairly quick sort of way as well um but yeah just i would say try it again and actually get feedback from people who someone pick someone that you know that does a nice non-metallic metal that you like and go and ask them for feedback 
Anyone else got any advice on non-metallic metals? It's just practice. Um, so when I first started doing it, um, before I painted that Major General Valoran or whatever his name is, um, <laughs> I um, I bought a, a five of the old um, AOS one box set liberators, um, and and basically I think I've still got the last one somewhere, but the first three i did i only did four of them i think i threw i basically just stopped after the first half an hour i went no nah, it's not working um it is just a practice thing it is a hard technique to do because you are trying to um you're trying to paint something on the model that isn't there um if that makes you're, sense so you're like trying to paint light yeah, yeah. basically mm -hmm. you, so if you normally if you if you say if you paint a um a gold storm cast um, mm -hmm. Uh, hammers a sigma uh, and you, you, know, you spray it gold you can wash it and do some highlights and you know whatever and and the light in the room will take care of that that 3d sort of that effect for you but you are trying to simulate that effect without having any of the sort of the, the light in the room do it for you if that kind of makes sense it is a hard thing to do you do need to think about okay where and i know when i first did it um I, I did one I, I, after the first couple. I did one leg, and I was like, "Yeah, that, that looks really good. I'm really happy with that." And then started on another part of the model and realized that in one of them, if you if you imagine the model standing in front of you, I had the light sort of shining from one direction, and then all of a sudden I started going from the other direction, and it just doesn't make sense, um, and it just threw the whole thing out. Um, so you do have to think a lot and plan ahead a lot about where. You've got to imagine where your light source is and always sort of keep that in mind. And if you do go from multiple angles, it will look unnatural and weird and you'll think this doesn't work. Um, it is a hard thing to do. It just takes practice. I think a big thing with non-metallic metals as well is that there are sort of two elements to it. There's trying to get your blends all really lovely and buttery smooth and all that sort of thing. Um, but there's also um, the element of making sure, um, as Travis was saying, it's getting your light placed right um, and with reflective surfaces where that light shines and how it'll shine and how it moves and shapes itself depends on the shape that it's shining onto um, benny in the chat had a um, has a really good point miniac um, does a fantastic tutorial on uh, not necessarily the blending of non-metallic metals or the color but where you should place those highlights because we're really good at picking up on you know just as humans, we're really good at picking up on something doesn't look quite right, but we're not always sure why. And generally, it'll come down to that. It's your, uh, you know, your reflections are just, they're reflecting the wrong areas. They're too harsh. They're too dark, things like that. Um, yeah, I would definitely call out Miniac and Vince Venturella from Warhammer Weekly uh, does hobby, hobby hack videos. And he's got, a re he's got some really good ones around this topic as well. So, um. I don't paint non-metallic metal, but I can tell you for someone who has looked into it, the one thing that I would say is, and this is again, my photography kicking in, is you need to understand light to a T, like in a way, like understanding like how light hits things. Um, and that's just looking at photographs, really. Like looking at like, or even looking around you, like if you have, we have metal all around us and stuff. If you can literally just shine a light of like where the direction is and where things are highlighted, that's one way to do it. Um, but I don't paint non-metallic metal. Um, it's just I don't generally have the time to like or patience for it. But that's one thing that I've always looked at is like you look at spaces around you, and then I think I will help you heaps to understand like how to get better at it. And um, and then as these guys said, you probably have to practice. This, like it's not going to be done overnight, like anything. Yeah, don't don't assume you can pick up some new contrast paints and do what Darren <laughs> Latham did with that stormcast <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> Maybe it is the, not, maybe it's not that simple. Maybe, maybe the next range of products will be GW, OSL, GW, non-metallic <laughs> metal. <laughs> can, I, can I just say, with, just with object source lighting and stuff, I remember um, I was at the store and I was like just working on a model and stuff and people came in being like, I want to know how to do OSL. And I literally was like, I'm not going to give you like the whole, like people like show me this heavily airbrushed stuff. And I'm like, it's a simple, just dry brush and like water down stuff. And that's how you do it. And everyone's like, I had no idea in that way. And um, it's just, yeah, it's just one of those things where like you, 
literally have just have to look at models closely and then remember the skills that you've picked up already and then try and add them to that in a way. I don't know if, those, if anyone here agrees, but like that's how I kind of learn how to do skills like OSL and stuff is like you literally just look at the models and figure out what skills you already know and then see if you can like use them to get to that effect in a way. Yeah, yeah don't overcomplicate things if you don't need to. Yeah, like... Like if people see OSL and they don't have an airbrush yet, they're probably going to think I need to buy an airbrush to do that when you can literally just dry brush it. Well, think think of the gym. You know, if 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 you go to the gym or I, or I, to... I don't I don't gym. <laughs> Pretend that you go to the gym. You just don't walk up and try to bench press two hundred kilos when in your first attempt. It's a yeah. muscle that you build over oh, time. Yeah. It's, it's practice. It's practice. <laughs> it's stretching. It's stretching. And, Eventually, you get as ripped as James is, and you you know you're deadlifting, and uh, and, you're, and you do stormcast strong. Yeah, <laughs> sweet. Uh, yeah, so exactly. my, my my last question from the committee, and then Liam, you can wrap us up. Uh, this is coming from Tim Barclay, aka uh, Aussie Wargamer, who was asking around. Um, he wanted to know a little bit more about the techniques about loading brush, loading up the brush. So, um, you know, things like brush control. Um, things like you know micro detail, but more importantly, like just he's struggling with loaded brushes. Um, any thoughts, ideas on, on the loaded brush? Uh, so I assume he's talking about the the loaded brush technique, which for anyone that doesn't know, it's where you put one paint on your brush like normal, but then you put a lighter color on the very tip of the brush, and you kind of like then use that one thing to blend as you paint. Um, if that is what he's talking about, my best sort of tips for that are the the sort of base color that's on your brush does need to be thinner um, than the highlight color that you've got on the tip of the brush. Um, that does need to be a thicker paint um, to be able to get it to move. Um, the other thing is when you actually go to apply the paint onto your model, obviously you want to want to pick the direction. So wherever your highlight is, that's where your brush wants to touch first because that's where the bright part of the paint is going to go. Um, and then paint in sort of um, a back and forth motion moving away from the highlight towards where the shadow is. Um, and as you move the brush, you want to be applying more pressure as you go. So you've essentially got more part of the brush touching the model where the darker paint is as you move along. The other thing to keep in mind is you don't have to do it in one pass. Um, you can do that once. It might look pretty streaky and a bit rubbish the first time you do it, but that's okay. Just wait let that bit of paint dry, and then go back in and do another coat exactly the same way, loading up the lighter color, starting in the light spot, working out to the darker point from there. And if you do that a couple of times, those different layers can sort of blend together and give you a smoother blend um, over time. Looks like really important open. that James just said, don't try and do it before it's dry. Yes. Yeah. Yep, you're going to get a big you old mess. Will, you will tear away the part of the paint that's still wet and then you'll wind up with this lovely, like, extra bit of detail you've just sculpted <laughs> in your miniature and it's a nightmare to try and fix. My mind is blank because I've never heard of that technique before. So Tim yeah. said it's helpful. Tim, yeah. Tim's yeah. acknowledged it. Yep, you've oh, nailed beautiful. it. Thank you. Yeah, um, again, there's really nice YouTube videos about that technique that you can check out. Um, it is a high, risk, high reward one though so yeah. yeah um so last couple of question is uh what painting hacks can you guys share to speed up the imp and improve your projects so i know nat you were talking about painting with washes and glazes but um is there any other techniques or stuff that you guys would recommend to like speed up and improve the projects um yeah a lot of the time i will uh, so i'll use that zenithal um prime um, or, you know, it doesn't have to be zenithal. You can, if you want to do side lighting on your model, you absolutely can, you know, just hold the model off to the side and spray that way. Um, but if I'm going for a really quick result, um, obviously, if I want to go something sort of crazy detailed, I'll spend more time and actually build up those highlights by hand. Um, but just applying layers of glazes, inks, shades, that you can all use them relatively in the same way um, to apply a semi-transparent layer of paint over the top of that. Um, and if you can still see that shade underneath, you effectively, you've cut out half an hour's worth of um, just sitting there blending. Um, and you can do it with underlying colors and things as well. So something that I have fun doing is spraying with a slightly cooler tone as uh, my base color. 
and then doing a zenith or prime or a highlight with um you know a slightly warmer tone and that gives that illusion of you know shadows being a slightly cooler color um and it's one of those things that it doesn't necessarily hold up to an amazing amount of scrutiny i wouldn't use it for you know a display model or like a, tom a competition model or anything like that um but for a really quick um you know good result it works really well sweet mm. um i guess in the in the hack space something we haven't talked about much at the moment is that your brush can be used for a lot more things than just putting paint into the brush and then putting that one color onto the model so we talked about the loaded brush just before already but you can also if you only load a small amount of paint on the tip of your brush you can then basically blend with one brush at a time just stick that paint in the spot where you want it and then gradually similar to the loaded brush just apply more pressure as you paint away from that spot and you'll sort of naturally use the water that's in your brush um, to start creating a blend um, so that can be a really quick way to get shadows into models um, you can use damp brushes to two brush blend on the model. You can wet blend on the model. You can also use damp brushes to erase paint if you make a mistake um, very quickly, get it on there and just sort of use it as an eraser to get rid of it. You can use it to push paint around the model. I find that really handy if you're wanting to do sharp edges like the, the sort of part that's in the middle of a sword, not the bits on the edge that you can't really get the edge of the brush on too well. You can put the paint down and then use the sort of clean damp brush to actually just push it into that sharp point to get a nice, nice line. So there's lots of stuff you can do with your brush that's not just put the color on it, put that color on the model. So yeah, that's, I guess, my best hack. Sweet. Travis? Oh, I'm not a good one for painting hacks to speed things up. I'm a very slow painter. Um, <laughs> I guess um, one thing I would I'll, I have thought about myself in the past uh, when I have attempted to do it fast. I mean, um, I guess is to play to your strengths if you if you know you have them. Um, so I tend to be uh, fine fine personally. I prefer and am better at painting um, non organic stuff. So armored models, things like that. Um, uh, versus you know uh, something like a Nurgle army or a bunch of orcs and stuff like that something like that um so i guess if you if you know you have that strength and it depend, obviously it depends what you're doing it for if it's something that you want to paint because you're trying to push yourself into a new space then ignore this but um if you are if you are looking for a new army project and you want to play to your strengths a little bit um that's something you can think about um but generally i'm a very slow painter so i'm a bad person to ask for how to speed things up i, I know for myself this is not everyone's cup of tea but I'm a batch painter, especially when it comes to like regiments, I'll paint 40 to 60 models at a time. And it sounds dull. And I know some people would just, uh, would just, it would do their heads in, but for me, the productivity of doing red on all in one model and then blue on all in one model. Uh, I find that that process allows me then like everything's uh, dry by the time I come back to the next stage. And I feel like I get a uniform approach, but again, that's not everyone's cup of tea. And obviously, if I was in a competition painting, uh, I wouldn't be batch painting, but uh, I find that's a great uh, hack or a productivity piece for me. Liam, do you have one? Um, mine's like similar to batch painting, but I think for me is like to improve and stuff. I feel like if you're doing an army, let's say, don't batch paint don't do all your battle line in like three weeks like do like one unit and then take a break to keep your motivation going because if you're not being motivated then you're going to stop and i do know like the more you paint as we said throughout this thing you get better but if you start like losing the motivation because it looks like quite a lot happening like let's say like for me i have 60 witch elves here i will lose my mind and i will lose motivation quite quickly and then i'll just drop off and i won't get better you just have this like massive break lump so pretty much if you just do like 10 at a time and then do a character in the middle and then like just changing up so similar to like what nat said at the very start is like be a bit of like a hobby butterfly like changing things up because that will improve and stuff and then you start speeding up a little bit because you'll get the battle line done quickly because you want to do that character because it's a motivation to keep going but that's probably like the one thing like i painted with washes and stuff so i use white coric spray quite a lot but now I'm probably going to go to the new spray Gracia after today's test run. 
um, just to speed up because it does the highlighting and everything for me. But yeah, that's pretty much it, really. Like, I'm I'm a very like get to tabletop standard painter. I'm not gonna like and, go for golden demon. And now you're gonna level up. Now this is the whole purpose. Liam's gonna level I will, up. I will be leveling up because I do have some cool projects that I want to get done um, and do well with. Um, so like some of the stuff for my doors of Kane army, which is my hobby army, um, where I've got some big characters and big conversions that I do want to get better. Um, and a lot of the stuff that you guys have talked about today will be getting used in it. Uh, maybe not an airbrush, but um, a few things. <laughs> so yeah, because I threw my airbrush at the wall from Rage. Um, <laughs> So yeah, well, you guys, you, know, you guys are you guys are laughing, but being full legit, it has been thrown at a wall. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it's okay because we know that the sucking at something is the first step to being sort of okay at something. So, oh, uh, mine was done, then you mine, get there. Mine was a hundred dollar eBay thing, and I totally understand why it was a hundred dollars because that included postage. So, um, <laughs> so we've we'll so, also yeah, all been very frustrated. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, I think that. Like for me, it's just to keep the motivation up will improve, help you speed up and improve because, um, yeah, because like if you don't get motivated, you're not going to get better. Um, and that's definitely one thing I think we all can agree on. But like if you, once you stop, you, it's hard to pick it back up at times, especially if you're yeah. on a roll. Yeah, yeah, it's good to have goals. That's for sure. It'll help you get that motivation to get towards them. But, but don't have a goal of saying, I'm going to get this army done in a month because it's not going to get good and you have yeah. to rely on contrast so. yeah that's the time pressure goal yeah, well it's, it's not a quality it, goal it, this goes back to goal setting um you know is it specific is it measurable is it uh, achievable you know can i do 2000 points in a week well if i quit my job and i don't go to sleep <laughs> yeah i can i can do 2000 <laughs> points in a week but you know and i think you guys have added a lot of value in, and even just sharing that you know, you're thinking of CanCon seven months out and you're already building models and painting. Um, if I want to have a high level army for CanCon, that's going to be uh, absolutely beautiful. You know, I, I, know I need to be preparing for it, not four months out. I need to be preparing it seven months out. And if the meta shifts or the army doesn't perform very well, I need to either quickly adapt or more importantly, stick through it because the goal is not the, the, the wins and losses, the, the goal is definitely about having this amazing or the best army you can on the table. And, you know, the preparation and the planning um, is going to get you there. Um, yeah. I think that's what I'm hearing a lot from, from you guys. And um, getting exposure, getting feedback, um, you know, reading and, and looking at other people and um, researching and, and asking people for advice. Um, these are all critical stages through the process uh, to improving your painting. Yeah, I think like one thing is like definitely like as James said earlier is like putting yourself out there, um, like going into competitions and stuff does get you make you better because I do know um, Dan Brewer, for example, he never really thought of himself as a top like painter. And then once he started putting his stuff on like competition stuff and he started getting feedback, he's like next level to the point now I'm like, Every time I see him, I'm like, please help me. Please. Mm. Yeah, so, it's amazing think... how quickly that kind of thing pushes you up. So, yeah, highly recommended people do that, get in those competitions, get that feedback. Yeah, I, so... I actually remember CanCon two years ago, Clint had, um, I think, Travis, you actually, you came up to me and said, oh, you're, you're nominated for Best Painted. And I'm like, no, I'm not. He's like, no, you are. And I'm like, eh, no, I don't think so. Uh, and, and I actually argued with Clint and I'm like, I don't want to be up there because that was my, my own limiting, limiting beliefs, holding me back and acknowledging that, you know, yeah, I might be not, not, might not be at the level of, let's say a Blake Kerwick yet, but I've, I'm being acknowledged and I need to accept that and, uh, use that as motivation and fuel to, uh, be better. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely one thing just to put yourself out there. And do, you guys, do you guys have any other final thoughts or any feedback that you guys want to share that you haven't acknowledged or uh, should I let you go to bed? Um, I just want to say that a big thing, especially for getting feedback, all this sort of stuff, is put yourself out in the different painting communities that we've got around us. Um, again, going back to the whole age of the internet thing, it's we live in a wonderful time where we can 
you know, get feedback, find information, all of that, you know, across the globe in an instant. Um, like we've got some fantastic um, work in progress Wednesday posts in the Age of Sigma Sydney group. Um, there are multiple sort of Australian painters groups, international painters groups, and that's just on things like Facebook. Um, there are fantastic blogs that are wonderful resource collections. Uh, you know, if you involve yourself out there, you're not only going to expose yourself to uh, more of the, you know, the feedback and things like that that are going to help you improve. Um, but you can also do your best to sort of emulate a, you know, a, a human-shaped knowledge sponge. And even if you see that information, you don't use it now, you'll use it later um, or you'll sort of tuck it away for next time. Um, and just expose and yourself. And ask, for it. and ask for it. Like if you're going to put it on yeah. a Facebook group and say, uh, you know, I want feedback, I'm, I'm, often, I'm often going to say, yeah, it looks great, you know, real positive things. But if you're like, I don't really know if these colours match, can I have some feedback on X? Be very specific on what you're looking for. Yeah. The community and, and be open to it people uh, will be very happy to share constructive criticism, not this looks like, like shit. It, it, you know, have you thought about this? Can you try this? So be open to it. I, th I think for me, I always like Twitter's a good resource, like fine, because Twitter is so instant. Twitter um, and Instagram are, are great resources. Yeah. Like I can literally hit up um, one of my favorite painters around the world, Ben Sabah. Um, and I'm like, hey, dude, how on earth did you freaking do this? And he would literally just give me like a step by step thing. I'm like, thank you. And then that'll be our conversation for the day. Um, but yeah, um, James, Travis, any last final thoughts or advice? I know we've said it a thousand times, but it really just comes down to practice. It is a skill that that takes time to learn. Um, and you've got to you've got to put some time into it if you want to if you want to improve the skill, I guess. Uh, Yep, sweet. Mm. So practice, practice, practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the biggest piece of feedback I probably give to people when they ask me about their miniatures is they need more contrast. Nat spoke about this before. Contrast, not the paint. This is going to get really confusing now <laughs> from GW, but contrast in the model um, is, yeah, people need more contrast in the model. It really is key. You need brighter highlights. You need darker shadows. You need to change between different colors of the model um you know where, where the values are actually at you can have shiny parts you can have dull parts but yeah just just more contrast on the model is generally the first thing i will tell the people need more contrast yeah. actually a great way of um looking at that as well is because we've pretty much all got smartphones now and you know every photo editing app has a way to basically remove the saturation from your pictures um a great way to just take a quick snapshot of your model and have a look at how much, you know, whether or not you need to push your contrast is to reduce the saturation down. And in the end, you should have something very close to black and very close to white across most of the areas of the model. Um, and you should have, you know, a focus on, you know, the part of the model you want to pay attention to, like the face or things like that. And that's a really handy thing to be able to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a really nice way to actually practice it um is to just paint a model using one dark color and one light color i'd normally suggest like a sort of dark desaturated blue something yeah. like incubi darkness and like an ivory color just paint a whole model using only those two colors and it forces you because the only thing that you've got to tell them apart is the contrast between the different parts of the model so that will really help you be able to see where you need to push it more practice if i if i'm hearing anything from you guys it's practice 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 schedule it try things out force yourself to to adopt new techniques i love it i love this stuff and right. get and get feedback constantly yep. feedback there's no such thing as failure only feedback if something sucks it didn't suck it's just try another tact yeah like i yeah for me it's just put, definitely practice 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 i'm gonna, I'm gonna pull out a thing. business quote here and they say that uh, albert einstein oh no, sorry, no thomas edison uh it took over a thousand uh, times to to develop the light bulb, uh, and when someone asked him about his 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 you know all the failures um, about creating that light bulb, he said, "I didn't I didn't fail a thousand times. I just learned a thousand different ways to create a light bulb." Uh, and I think this is is um, so very true. Is we're all on a learning part, and art is abstract, and just enjoy the process. Um, so 
like for me having a photography one i remember we had this thing saying you could get given a roll of film which is 36 times so you have 36 shots and if you get one good shot out of 36 you've won like you have won like if it's even like not like a masterpiece but as long as you have one shot that's like properly in focus or everything like that you have like nailed it and it just takes time to like then get 36 perfect exposures then you've like on a good roll so right, we're on a Tony yeah. Robbins inspirational quote piece here. Yeah. Anyone else got an inspirational quote before we wrap it up? James, what's your inspirational quote? Um, probably, or, or a saying I like to refer back to is, is you, you know enough already, just get started. Um, you don't need to get yourself trapped in this loop of watching more YouTube videos, trying to learn more techniques. You just need to get down there, actually put paint on the damn model, get started. And that's how you get better. Love it. Nat, what's your inspirational quote? Oh, goodness knows. Now, try weird things until you fail and then figure out what worked before you got there. Um, you know, th just get yourself out of your comfort zone and you'll find some really spectacular things. I'm so inspired. How am I going to get to bed? Trav, what's the <laughs> love? What's the love? Uh... I, 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 there is one that I, I was 99% sure I remembered, but I just quickly looked up. <laughs> I don't even know why I learned this, but um, since we're on this this grand adventure now, um, so the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, but the optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. And I had it back to front originally, but it's an inspirational thing. But um, you know, it it might you might, and particularly when I've sat down to to learn new things, I thought, yeah, this is this is impossible. I don't know how I'm possibly going to do it, um, and it it will be difficult um, to do. But you know, give it a go, and if you doesn't work you can chuck that model in a uh, container full of um simple green and have another crack in 24 hours time <laughs> <laughs> and while we're all inspired travis if they want to hear more about your inspirational uh words to the world where can they find you uh so predominantly on um twitter so i always get this thing wrong and I'll double check I don't even know my own handle um it's, so right. it's in the comment section it's in the, the <laughs> show description but it's like thonius 83 no, no one can it? at you then thonius 83 all right so it is a channel description nat where can people find and, and obviously uh travis is the more handsome person of the heralds of wolf uh, clip really <laughs> yeah like um like that it's an audio podcast Clint, clint's the brainy one <laughs> travis is the the attractive one and adam is the uh is the brawn i was about i was, I was like you were like hesitating i was like what are you going to describe uh yeah <laughs> I, I, wanted, I wanted to make sure i didn't uh, take on the wrath of adam uh but more importantly nat where can people find you um, so primarily on Instagram is where I post most of my stuff. Um, so that's um, at Evelina. Um, otherwise, I've got EVA Studios um, on Facebook. And James? Uh, Twitter mostly. You can track me down at Spongy Paint. Um, I'm also on Instagram, but I am pretty bad at Instagram. I'm trying to get better and actually post my stuff over there. So generally Twitter is where you'll be able to find me, have a chat about stuff. You know where to find Shadowhammer and Anthony Magro. So, uh, team, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for all the, the knowledge and the insights that you guys have shared. Holy shit, this is almost three hours. This is insane. Uh, I feel like I've leveled up my, my, my painting to some crazy level. I'm going for Golden Demon. This has been amazing. <laughs> We got ever chosen first, man. Ever chosen first, then Golden uh, Demon. That's, that's a it's a short term goal. It's all about. Like, <laughs> it's, it's like it's uh it's. Remember how there. we just like, remember how we just discussed set goals and then no, but the like everyone's, goal goal ever chosen? <laughs> everyone's quotes have inspired me to go for Golden Demon. So whoever whoever on last year's, you suck. I'm coming for you. I now have the power and the wisdom of of these three amazing painters. James, so Natalie, you actually do it. <laughs> Travis, thank you for your insights. Liam, always a pleasure. Take it easy, guys. Thanks for having us, guys. It's been fun. Yeah. Chat to you guys next fortnight. See you guys.